of Director of Global Health of AMSA International for the tenure 2020-2021. She has also been working as an innovative for health project finalist and developer under John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in America. Please, Kush, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, that's for the lovely introduction. Um, a good afternoon to everyone joining us here today at the session, at the first day of the Global Health Masterclass. Uh, organized under the Global Health Subsidiary of AMSA International, and it is an initiative uh, started by the two MDs of AMSA International, namely Kat and Mol, who are here with us today as well. Without much further ado, I would like to begin uh, with the session. That's the first out of the four sessions that is an introduction on global health and AMSA that we'll be discussing more about today. First of all, what does global health actually mean? So global health is actually an expansion or evolution from tropical medicine, international health, and is a transdisciplinary field involving many of these fields working together. We are actually inspired by two different interpretations, though there might be many. So one that defines global health as an area of study, research, and practice that places priority on improving health and achieving health equity for all the people worldwide. And second, which defines global health as those health issues that transcend national boundaries and governments and call for actions on the global forces that determine the health of people. For instance, currently the COVID-19 pandemic has been the most important and the burning issue as one global health issue. So global health may include a comparison of health states and programs across countries, uh, but is not limited to low or high income countries or geographical regions around the world. So I believe there's always a confusion as to what is the difference between global, international, and public health. A little bit uh, of a differentiating table, uh, which we received from Coffin et al. Uh, states global health in terms of geographical outreach as focusing on issues that directly or indirectly affect health, but can transcend national boundaries. Whereas international health focuses on health issues of countries other than one's own. There is then, we talk about public health, it specifically focuses on issues that affect the health of the population of your own country. Level of cooperation, as you can already see in global health, it's uh, development and implementation between the countries and requires global cooperation. Whereas in international health, it's more of a binational cooperation. And in public health, it's an individual. It's an internal uh, matter of the chapter itself. Then access to health is health equity among nations. Uh, for, and for all people is a major objective for global health, whereas for international health, the, chap the country seeks to help the people of the other country, and in public health, as I just mentioned, it's solely uh, the issue of the, the chapter or the country itself. Moving ahead, talking about the global health issues, there are a wide variety of global health issues that currently transcend uh, boundaries and are very important uh, to the global health scenario. I would just like to highlight a few main important ones, starting with one, pandemics, as we've currently been in uh, since 2020 and the global disease outbreaks such as COVID-19, whereas in the past we've also uh, been exposed to pandemics such as uh, related to SARS, MERS, etc. Second, environmental factors, as we are all aware, uh, the climate change has been one of the greatest threats to human health and the Paris Treaty has been something that's been signed by chapters on a global level to bring change in regards to the climate. Third, as a global health issue, is economic disparities and access to healthcare. When we talk about economic disparities and access to healthcare, um, it's more of a national issue as well, as well as being a global health issue, whereas low and middle income countries are not might not be able to get proper access to healthcare in comparison to their counterparts, as well as within a country, there might be disparities and access to an illegal access to healthcare depending on the social strata. Fourth is the political factors. For instance, the in, internal political uh, issues and factors prevalent within a country might lead to unrest and make the population vulnerable uh, to certain global health diseases, depending on the policies of the government. Second, uh, situations such as refugee migration from different countries uh, might actually, where refugees might not be even having access to healthcare, 
my another big major brain health issue, which has been um, affecting the, the chapters and the different countries globally since many years. First is the non-communicable diseases. As we're already aware, the NCD burden has been quite rising uh, since the urbanization and the period of globalization. And when we talk about NCDs, it includes a, includes a wide variety of diseases, such as heart diseases, stroke, cancer, diabetes, courtesy of sedentary lifestyle, uh, use of products like alcohol, tobacco, etc. Sixth, one of the major global health issues includes animal health, food sourcing and supply. As we are already aware that animals uh, play a major role in the food chain, as well as in the process of developing the antimicrobial resistance. So thus it has been indirectly being related to the human health and posing a threat. Sharing one of the major global collaborations um, during the COVID-19 is the ACT Accelerator, which was, ACT is a short form for the access to COVID-19 tools. It was a groundbreaking global collaboration aimed to develop, to accelerate development, production, and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatments, and vaccines. Launched at the end of April 2020 at an event co-hosted by the Director General of the WHO, Presidents of Finance, European Commission, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the ACT brings together scientists, governments, businesses, civil society, and philanthropists, and global health organizations working together. Following the ACT accelerator launch, UNICEF and BAHO became the delivery partners for COVAX, the vaccine spiller. So thus, these organizations have actually joined forces to speed up the end of the pandemic by supporting the development and equitable distribution. Currently, as of 2021, the targets for the ACT accelerator include distributing 2 billion vaccines, 245 million treatments, establishing testing for 500 million people in low and middle income countries, and strengthening the health systems needed to support them. Moving ahead uh, to the global health issues and which are the what are the major challenges that need to be addressed. Early in 2020, WHO had released a list of urgent global health challenges with in inputs from experts around the world, reflecting deep concern that leaders have been failing to invest resources in poor health priorities and systems. This puts lives, livelihoods, and economies in jeopardy. And none of these issues are actually simple to address, but they're within reach. Um, there are a total of 10 main challenges that WHO has identified in the list and as are visible in the screen, which chiefly include elevating health in the climate debate, delivering health and conflict in crisis, making healthcare fairer, expanding access to medicines, stopping infectious diseases, preparing for epidemics, most importantly, protecting people from dangerous products, investing in people who defend our health, and that's the healthcare professionals. Lastly, uh, keeping adults safe and earning public trust. All the challenges in this list demand a response from more than just the health sector. With the deadline for the 2030 sustainable development goals quickly approaching, the UN General Assembly has underscored that the next 10 years must be the years of the decade of action. Moving ahead to a very interesting uh, program that the Global Subsidy has been pl planning since a while as the AMSOP, which basically refers to the Asian Medical Students Outreach Program. So AMSOP is a community and public health-based program aiming to provide a platform to members of AMSA International to expand opportunities and knowledge-driven volunteerism, sharing a sense of responsibility among medical students, encouraging the exchange of learning experiences between them, and enhancing cross-cultural understanding as well as to lift a specific community's quality of life through outreach-based and community service programs that are people-oriented and environment-friendly. And AMSA will ideally consist of two committees one is the local committee and the second is the foreign committee. So the local committee would chiefly comprise of the hosting chapter as one the bidding proposal and the foreign committee would consist of participants from various AMSA chapters who have been selected to participate in a particular AMSA. Moving ahead, what would an AMSA ideally consist of? So there would be three main aspects um, corresponding to the vision of AMSA International, that is the knowledge, action, and friendship. So the first aspect would be to promote knowledge-driven volunteerism, wherein uh, 
we aim to produce volunteers of high quality and efficiency and orientation or training program would be introduced on the first few days of AMSO. Initial orientation and training are necessary to introduce to the participants on the background and definition of the mission or the course in detail. The more they're exposed to and understand the nature of the course, the more they will be able to contribute by means of public relations and advocacy. Second is to share responsibilities as medical students in reaching out to communities across the region, which corresponds to the actual vision of ANSA International. Under this vision, after being adequately trained through the orientation program, the, here comes the execution phase, wherein participants will be taken to site by transportation arranged by the hosting chapter and the activities would be. For this purpose, a crowdfunding would be initiated for the targeted mission. So the crowdfunding platform should be ideally established a minimum of two months prior to the first year of an AMSOC to gain an essential amount needed to cover the expenses throughout the mission. The proceeds would be solely dedicated to the course and would not be utilized uh, for, for or during programs or events that fit the convenience of the participants, such as the orientation, transfer, and competition. There would be separate fees which would be taken for the participants to cover the same. Moving over to the third aspect, that is the friendship, wherein team building activities, social programs, etc., would be posted during the last days of the AMSOC to foster lasting bonds between participants and to enhance cross cultural understanding among them. So, this brings us uh, to the end of the very brief but short session about introducing global health and I'm sure we'd now open the floor to the questions. Back to you, Minita. Thank you. Thank you, Kush, for the interesting presentation. Few of the participants had previously filled in the questions in the registration form, and we would like to put it forward to our speaker. So here are the questions. So for the first question, are there any specific criteria that classify as a health problem into a global health problem? Kush, you may answer this first. Yes. So when we talk about classifying a health problem into a global health problem, as I mentioned in the definition of global health, the issue should transcend national boundaries and should concern uh, the governments of more than three countries um, and should transcend, secondly, uh, the continents, across the continents. So then an issue or a health problem or is classified as a global health problem. Back to this. I hope that answers the question. All right. Thank you, Kush, for your answer. Now moving on to the second question how to contribute in global health issues as a first year medical student. As a first year medical student, what you can always do is understand about the learning and the functioning of the global health, the global health architecture, uh, the various stakeholders involved in the, the system of global health and take part, uh, part, as, part in the opportunities available in global health. So opportunities might include initially um, taking part in global health trainings, taking part in global health lectures, to understand better and get exposed to the field of global health. As you progress through the years, you can participate in global health discussions um, hosted at international level by well-known organizations such as WHO, UN, and can also look forward, uh, if interested, to pursue a career further in global health. Okay, thank you for your answer, Kush. Now moving on to the third question, how to keep updated with the global health issues? Right. So in regards to this question, um, I believe there are various aspects for you to keep updated with the global health issues. One important aspect uh, to this would be being regularly updated with the international health scenario. You could do that while using um, a health, uh, health platform we are delivering budgeted news in your country, or you can also um, use that by using educational platforms like Twitter, uh, where you could always search uh, global health issues, even, even by hashtag, and you could find out the relevant details. Besides that, um, 
besides the update that you can always uh, look forward for new opportunities, um, take up self-learning courses on global health uh, to stay updated regarding the progresses, as well as I believe uh, organizations like WHO and UN and the subsidiaries are very well posed and regularly follow them in the updates will keep you updated with the global health issues as well. All right, then. So now we'll be opening the floor to the audience. Do we have any additional questions from our participants? You can type your questions in the chat feature of the Zoom, or you can raise your hand as well. Or maybe if you are shy, you can just personal chat me and then I will share it to the floor as well. Any questions for Kush? All right, someone just PC me a question. So, Kush, is there any reason AMSOP that has been held since 2020 until now? So AMSOP is actually a new program which had, had been withheld uh, considering the current COVID-19 pandemic situation. Uh, we do plan to uh, incorporate into a virtual platform, but I feel AMSOP as I just presented and mentioned, is where we aim to impact the community at the ground level itself. So we plan to relaunch it by this July, uh, depending on the situation uh, in regards to the current COVID-19 pandemic, because for us, the security and the safety of our members is the priority, and we would in no way want to risk um, them in any sense. Thank you, Kush, for your answer. Does that answer your question, Alicia? Okay, I believe it's already enough. Does anyone still have question for Kush? Okay, maybe I believe that everyone is already excited, cannot wait for the small group discussion. Thank you for all your wonderful and interesting questions. That ends the, part, the first part of our session. We hope that it was very informative to you guys. Now moving on to the small group discussion session. So we will be sharing the instruction for the small group discussion. Um, the link uh, to the small group discussions has been shared in the chat box. You can please take uh, the next two minutes uh, to view the sheet and rename yourself as group number, underscore your name and underscore your chapter underscore your position. We will be opening the breakout rooms by, uh, by 5.35 GMT plus eight. So as soon as uh, you rename yourself, we will be allocating you to the breakout room.
Hello again, again everyone, as everyone is already in the main room, let's proceed to the second session. I hope that you had a lovely first meeting with your group mates and had an amazing discussion. So for the second session, of the essential of planning public health projects, page one, ideation delivered by our guest speaker, Ms. Sondriana Monga. She is a final year medical student at Maulana Azad Medical College in New Delhi. She is also a student license committee co-chair at Global Medical Education Collaborative. She is also appointed as the director of public health and research development of ANSA International tenure of 2020-2021. She is enthusiastic about medical education, equity in healthcare, public health, gender equality as stated in SDG, SDG 5, eating food, good music, and sleeping. We would like to welcome you to the session. Ms. Sondriana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nindita. Uh, you've said it all. I don't need to introduce myself. That was a great welcome. Uh, welcome and hello to all the public health enthusiasts present here. I'm gonna presume all of you are public health enthusiasts. And if you aren't, I hope you are by the end of the session. Without further ado, I would like to proceed. So this is the topic that's been given to me that I'll be speaking about. Before I proceed further, a disclaimer, I am no public health expert. I don't have fancy degrees in public health. However, what I do have is experience, experience of working and leading the public health and research department of AMSA India and working with a great, brilliant team. And that's the experience I'd like to share with all of you here. So uh, let me just, yep. So these are the few points that I'd like to be speak, uh, touch on through this presentation. Uh, I'd like all of us to just envision the one public health project we want to work on at this moment in time. When I, when we started building on the public health and research department, there were so many things we wanted to do. We wanted to work on gender equality. We wanted to work on sanitation and hygiene. We wanted to touch upon so many aspects of public health that are all very, very essential, all very much needed and everything that needs attention. But if it's not placed in a systematic manner, it doesn't, give us the fruit we want. And this, I hope this presentation helps you understand how we try to um, assimilate all that information, all that want and aim, and just order, put, it, put it in an orderly fashion into our 11 public health projects that we worked on. So uh, this is a brief intro. Let's start with the problem statement. So that's how we started. What is, your, what is the problem you want to solve? Like I said, so many problems, but let's start with one problem statement. So uh, if I take the example of project um, Back to Protect, that was one of the projects we worked on. So it focused on infectious diseases. Infectious disease also broad category, very broad category, aligned with SDG 3.3, but that's something I'll come on to later on. Um, it could be, let's, then we need to be more specific about the problem. TB perhaps, because it's very prevalent in my country. At this point in time, maybe COVID-19. So just that problem statement, what is the problem that you want to solve? What is something that you see every day and you would like to work on? So you need to define that problem statement, design it. Beware for that, it's very important for you to be up to date with the current happenings. It, at this point in time, a lot of the other problems in our society, public health concerns have taken a backseat because of COVID-19, but those are also very important that, that we cannot forget about. And COVID and TB, COVID and HIV, COVID and cancer, so many things have gone hand in hand and there are public health policies that need to be made, keeping that in mind. Does not mean that those previous health concerns are no longer important. So you need to be aware of what's happening. Then you need to listen to your community. Again, reading newspapers, social media, Twitter handles, just seeing what people are talking about, what is affecting who, in what area, at what point in time. And then link it with the SDGs and targets and indicators, which would streamline your work to give you the proper goal and aim. So these are the questions. This is basically the previous slide, but these are the questions that I asked my team, I asked myself before we formatted those 11 projects. 
what are the issues start local so uh, there's a saying think local act global so this is basically that what are the issues my college is dealing with let's start with my college my college the target population could be my professors could be the medical students so the medical students um, are they facing addiction a lot of them are are they uh, sleep deprived mental health issues mental health addiction two very very important concerns so you could start with charity begins at home so you could start with the people around you your your uh, fellow fellow colleagues or my city what is my city dealing with uh, perhaps it could be something that's specific to your area and not your country but very specific to your city your state or your country that's how you can begin by creating that problem statement then what do people care about at this point no one cares about anything except covid-19 so maybe we could talk about that and then associate it with other public health problems which sdg does sol does solving this issue contribute to so uh, sdg i hope most of you all know is a sustainable development goal of the united nation so we associated all our projects with one or more of these sdg goals this just helped us align the idea in a proper format and uh, just streamline the points and goals so uh, specifically sdg 3 is something we associated all of our projects with because that is something as medical students we connect with the most good health and well being it has sub categories all of them are health related in one way or the other not that the others aren't but this is more specific to us that we can really create an impact on as a part of the medical community so these are the sdgs we worked on we associated them with our projects saw the sdg goals and the targets set for 2030 or 2025 and then saw how we as medical students with that project in mind could help contribute to it in our at our level so that's how we that's the step 2 if i may say so defining the problem statement and aligning it with the specific sdg i'm going to explain with example further a very important and very fun component so these are pictures from our projects that we conducted offline uh, where and whom does this problem affect so if i am considering a problem of health and hygiene uh, the lack of health uh, and hyg hygiene in our country very broad a very broad problem so who is the target population that i want to focus on making it very specific to <clears throat> sorry making it very specific to say children or teenagers adolescents or a geriatric population or the working reproductive age group helps me create better resources and target them in a more effective manner because when i'm talking to children i cannot tell them about um, when i'm talking to uh, young children uh, below pre pre teenagers i cannot just start off with so yeah that's that's one of the problems that happens and sdgs and you know contraception and they'll go berserk they'll, they'll look at me like i'm a mad woman and they will also not connect with me and that's not something i want so when we would so this is something we did in our project chalang which aims at targeting children young children of school uh, these are the pictures from uh, another project but this is the a population that we targeted we created games to tell, talk to them about gender equality we uh, gave them examples of famous sports persons and uh, different examples of successful leaders to teach them gender equality exists uh, when you imagine a doctor who do you see and many of them said uh, a man why do you see a man and we asked them we forced them to think about it so that's that's how we approached them and that same approach would not work with a person of um, the reproductive age group or a geriatric population to target them you need to target them making them feel concerned and raising their concerns about their own health issues you could well that's a different approach to how to approach different target population that's why it's very important for us to understand and specify that at this point in time i need to target this age group and that's my target population these are the points that you need to identify and probably pick up a pen and note down about your target population when you're thinking about this so the area of your target population is it um an urban area is it a rural area are they living living in slums do they have access to clean water because if i go on to the slums of even delhi where i'm living and preach so you can buy an aro purifier and you know you can buy an air purifier to do this they won't they just they mute my voice and never listen to me again and they will never be able to relate with me so i need to put my shell myself in their shoes look at their resources that's another point mentioned the resources of the target population 
who is the target population what is the economic background why are they not able to achieve health care why don't they have access to universal health care and how can i and they together make it happen so a lot of points are needed here so these are a list of the points that we formed uh, while doing a bit of research so who is the target population a contact person this is quite helpful so while while you're approaching someone for say a uh, street play so that's something that's a great form of uh, raising awareness i feel and it's also very fun so when we we're, uh, we're kind of organizing a health camp or a street play or something that's there, we we're going at the ground level and interacting with people it's always helpful to have one of them be a part of our team so it could be not a complete part of our team as in uh, they're helping us form uh, you know actually conduct the street play but just gathering people it it should be someone you need to have a contact person of your of that local population someone they trust someone they listen to because they don't know you and they will not listen to you they might not always listen to you unless th there needs to be a starting point and to have that contact person is always helpful it could be a local uh, so in our in our country we have uh, anms ashas those are local healthcare workers from the community so it could be some person like that it could be um, a head of the society head of the village something like that so a person of contact that will help you bridge this gap between the community and you so what are the how do they perceive their problem so if i talk about um, sexually transmitted diseases it could be a taboo in most communities and people don't want to talk about it how to prevent it contraception could be a uh, absolute no don't talk about it uh, topic in families why do they perceive the problems like that there are so many myths about it uh, that even vaccination this is some like the rampant today's topic people are spreading rumors like uh, it could cause sterility in the population it will lead to this it will lead to that how do they perceive the problems is very important in understanding so we can break those problems uh, people being hesitant about vaccines is something that can easily be dealt with just creating a bit of more communication and bridging this gap between the healthcare community and the society so um what is important to the target population if they are not meeting their daily requirements of basic nutrition water and sanitation they will not be interested in contributing to a greater uh, public health venture you want to initiate you need to first solve their small problems and not small problems their basic problems and needs and then proceed on to the bigger issues for them how can the target population contribute to the topic maybe educating target that's that's one of the great things that our government also tries to initiate through a lot of the public health programs is it's like peer to peer education camp so you educate half a section of the community and ask them to educate their neighbors and their friends and families and pass that information on i think it's most it's one of the most efficient way of actually conducting any public health camp or survey or awareness uh, session because you more more likely to believe and listen to people who you actually like and you know and trust your family and friends that's why we get in the mess of those whatsapp forwards so that that's a great way to target we felt and um the rest of the points i think have been covered so this is how we formed our problem tree so i'm going to uh, explain with the help of example if you think this is okay this makes no sense it will in a minute or two so you need to design a problem statement like i talked about and then think of the reasons or rather the causes of why it is happening and then the causes for that then you flip it to make an objective tree an objective tree will form your outcome statement um so ponder on this we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them i wish i was the person saying this but it's albert einstein and i'm just quoting him but very relevant towards uh, when you're thinking about creating a problem tree and the objective tree with it so short example um this is my problem statement one out of three children in this area i'm studying are not going to school why are they not going to school i ask myself this question i ask them the question maybe i conduct a survey and i come across these three causes lack of sanitation not enough educators need to support their family so they are working and they're not enough schools in that area and lack of sanitation why is lack of sanitation the cause because due to lack of sanitation they fall sick they they are prone to more communicable diseases 
and there are not enough educators because people are not interested in teaching in that area as a uh, profession. And then uh, the government is not, provi not providing them enough incentives. And then they need to work to support their family because there's no food on the table. And then you go on to the level one of causes and then level two of causes until you reach a dead end. That is, then we think of further causes. These are the further, this is the continuation of the table. And I'm just think, uh, putting across here the more ca causes, a cause and a cause, and this is the reason behind this. And that's the reason behind that cause. And finally, we come on to the final level where we can't think further, or perhaps we've this is we've exhausted our brain cells for that time. And now we start thinking of solutions to each point, each level of these problems. So in the blue box below are the solutions, like the exact point where we can attack and as many also a lot of these points now you need to think of which statement in the tree are the ones which we can correct or impact through our activities we're medical students we have limited resources but we definitely can make an impact we need to find those levels of solutions or the causes where we can tap in where we can just pick it up and how we can make a difference a lot I will not say that there is uh, there are some problems that are out of our control completely, because even problems and solutions that require change at the level of policies can have us put in the action in terms of advocacy. So if we need to pick up and raise the awareness and raise a call for a ch like a big change at a great level, we can do that by starting starting that spark that perhaps starts the advocacy chain that leads that reaches out to the policymaker who will who can finally make a change we can start doing that too however at the level of a medical as medical students what we can do uh, directly is by reaching out to the community uh, by fundraisers by awareness campaigns and not when i'm talking about community i'm not just talking about people i'm talking about gen not general people i'm talking about our colleagues a lot of the times we can start by, so we had this uh, problem last year that we couldn't go out. We couldn't reach out to the community offline. How did we battle that? We ta started targeting them indirectly by targeting our medical students. So we did this uh, survey by for two projects, Project WASH and Project Swasta Jivika. The names might seem uh, relevant to you right now because that's how I correlate to. So these are two projects we worked on and uh, how we did is we tapped into medical students. That's the population that I have access to even online. And we recruited them, trained them to conduct surveys for their house help, for their watchman, for their local guard, or for their gardener, whoever they had access to at that point in time. And they raised awareness to that small measure. Now that might seem very small number, one person, okay, two person, three person, okay. But multiply that, by 64 people of our team doing that exponentially to the 200 plus college heads we had uh, as our uh, national working group and the two to three four people they contacted each that that's an exponential increase in the target population we achieved and the impact we had and even if we were able to change bring about a change in about 10 of them i'd say even about one of them our entire effort was successful. So as a medical student also, the, the numerous ways through which you can do it, and even a pandemic shouldn't stop you from doing that. So this is uh, the summary so far. Set smart goals with timeline, always respect time, define action steps, very important. You need to have, as, a, as leaders, all of you are leaders, you need to have that action steps set out beforehand, before you're initiating a project. I think a very important part of leadership at any level is foresight. So while you're planning, in, in not just ensuring that the activities are purposeful, fun, and result-oriented, but just having that foresight of, okay, now we, so let's take the example of this uh, session right now. I'm sure the organizers, we had the dry run yesterday, and they just went by it. And that's how systematic, just, it should be by all the leaders. So it prevents any last minute changes and you have you have resources ready you have backup people there to just step in if something goes wrong so that's very important put yourself self in the shoes of the target population while deciding this is something i've already stated 
then how do we know what we are doing is working? Very important. Not, not only your projects should not only just be purposeful and uh, impactful during the planning, the results should also be there. There were a couple of um, events that we organized who we put our heart and soul into it and we thought it's the best idea we've ever come up with. But we did not get the impact or the result we were hoping for. We did not get the same amount of results, outcome, output that we were going for. And it is important for us. It, it's not measured just so for a lot of our online sessions, we measure it, measured it by our um, members who are participating in, in the activity. But a lot of them, even activities. So we had a um, project Muskarahat, which was for mental health. We had an event for confessions unplugged. So it was an absolutely anonymous session. And uh, there was a psychologist, we, we called in psychologists and psychiatrists to organize it. And everyone had their cameras off, the names were changed to maintain that anonymity. We had about 30 participants only, one of our low participant events. But that was hugely successful, very impactful. And given the things we were talking about, so it was, as the name suggests, Confessions Unplugged. So uh, it was meant to be a more secretive, reclusive kind of an event. And it was very successful because the response we got from the 30 people who participated, they asked us to do it again because they would love that kind of a free online discussion and not wanting to share their identity because they just want to talk, talk with that freedom of not being able to share their identity and yet get an, uh, and not just sharing it on an online random platform, but actually talking to a professional and getting an honest, right path to talk about it. So that helped a lot, even though it had low participation. So you need to define your indicators. So these are some of the indicators we defined our projects with. For each of the projects that we worked on, 11 of them, we formed a project head module in the very beginning. In that module, we defined two things besides the many other aims, objectives, why do we name this project this way and all of that. We defined a one-year goal and a five-year goal. So that is, at this point in time, this is when I'm starting this pro project in May 2020, this is my one-year goal. And that goal is not the aim of the project because the aim is a long-term thing. I'm, I'm working on health and hygiene, but my one-year goal is educating medical students. One-year goal about the importance of health and hygiene. Then my five-year goal could be area specific or it could be uh, more abstract. So um, spreading health and uh, the awareness of, of perhaps hand washing more specific in the area of Delhi. It could be more specific to that, but that's my five-year goal. It should be more than that, I hope. And I'm, I, I, and if I'm able to achieve that, it's a milestone check. If I'm not, then I need to look back onto my work and see what went wrong. How can I improve? And that's very important when you want to really make something concrete. So these are tips that we try to inculcate through our work. Always, always aim for quality over quantity. Like I said, a lot of our events did not have 100 plus participants all the time, but that did not discourage us. We, we reminded ourselves that we need to tap in for feedback. Feedback is very important. And if those people are coming back to our next event without incentives to, we're doing something right. Then encourage wild ideas in your team. Encourage wild ideas. Don't shut down your ideas because you think that that's not possible right now. Why is it not possible? And then creating thought clouds help me. So this is something um, a quote really, I, I recently read it, so I wanted to add this here. Because you're all leaders of tomorrow, I'd like to share this with you all. Leadership is the ability to influence, inspire, and motivate others to achieve and even go beyond their goals. It is also the ability to anticipate and respond to change. Leadership is not necessarily synonymous with the position of authority. I think that's the most important line here. It can also be informal. So many times we've seen leaders at positions of power who are not capable of actually understanding the needs of their audience and not being able to conduct themselves the right way. So you don't always have to be at that position to, of power to actually make a change. You can be leaders at your levels at, as medical students, as young professionals of today and future doctors of tomorrow. You can, you can create whatever you want to do 
at your level and still be a leader without a formal position is what i want to say and this is my favorite slide <laughs> no it's not all of my slides are good <laughs> so this is uh, recently we released um, this uh, book your book reflections for public health and research department and this contains kind of a summary of all our work in the past year it has all the events we worked on a bit information about the events and message from the entire team of public health research department 64 members strong and on the left most end is other 11 projects stated with their basic aim and the right most end is uh, the favorite instagram page i follow <laughs> public health and research department so you can check out the reflections yearbook phr yearbook if you want to know more about the kind of events we conducted given that it was a pandemic year we did do most of our events online but a lot of them were also offline towards the end of it so with that i would like to end my presentation thank you thank you so much miss sonriana for your amazing and insightful presentation now let's start with the question and answer session so few of the participants who had filled in the questions from the registration form and we would like to raise the questions for you to answer so the first question will be what is the main thing that has come to mind in the ideation process should we prioritize the relevance of global health problems that is the most prevalent or more to the feasibility or budgeting manpower or resource that we have and in a cost that they master in or have previous experience in that was a long question can i ask you to break it down or repeat it please okay so basically um she uh, the participant is asking about the how do we prioritize the relevance and the feasibility in conducting a public health a program awesome i think i got it so um prioritizing i i think that uh, that is a lot of factors come into play according to me it depends on your target population like i said if you want to talk about um something like gender equality which is very important it might not be a priority for a population that's not able to meet the basic requirements for water and sanitation and food so if they are below the poverty line that that seems like an irrelevant issue to them so you need to prioritize you don't get to prioritize your target population is the main indicator for through which you prioritize it so it depends on your target population and also timing like like in the beginning i stated current affairs reading about what's happening everything else becomes irrelevant when we're talking about covid at the point even right now in india after a year of battling through it we still back in that situation where we're in under lockdown and covid-19 is still the biggest concern vaccination drive is a boon so all of that is still the biggest concern for us and all the other problems take a back seat and the good part here is that a lot of the things so our government launched the immunization relaunched the immunization program for covid and with that a lot of the normal uh, national immunization school uh, program uh, vaccines are being given as a priority to the young mothers uh, and uh, infants who missed their vaccination because of the lockdown so it's covid plus vaccine it could also be tb plus uh, covid so your priority here the common point becomes covid and the rest of it kind of just accompanies it so you need to check your um, surroundings check your check your target population what is the problem that concerns them right now and if they are at so if i'm talk, targeting someone uh, in an urban family who's going to the job every day and they have the basic means i could target to talk to them about contraceptives i could talk to them about gender equality i could tap into them about occupational diseases so that that would be the right target uh, population for that i hope that answers the question thank you for your thorough answer maybe we can proceed to the second question what is the best way to influence people about global health in this pandemic situation great question i think this is something uh, we've been trying to figure out since last year i uh, i'll just state what worked in a lot of the situations i 
as medical students, just raising awareness about right now vaccines, about social protocols that need to be followed amongst the non-medicals we are in contact with. So as, as a general part of the medical population, I think we understand the need for vaccines. I think none of us are here, anti-vaxxers, who are questioning, do the vaccines work? Because I believe, we believe it works. We know it works. And a lot of us must be vaccinated too. At this point in time, I have uh, a lot of non-medicals reach out to me with questions like, will I die if I get COVID vaccine? Because I had contracted COVID last month. Um, questions like, does COVID vaccine uh, really not make you infertile? Very random, very, which might seem absurd to me at one point in time, but with, because there's so many people who have those doubts, it's not absurd at all. I think at our point in time, just answering those questions with a lot of patience and explaining to them the cause behind it, not just saying you need to get the vaccine. I mean, you have to, there's no option behind it. That doesn't work. You need to explain to them how vaccines are made. Perhaps that helps. You need to tell them, I got vaccinated. Trust me, it helps. And then also sharing instances that you have as proof that vaccines work. Because I, I, I can give examples directly with names that I know a family in which one person got contracted with COVID and the rest of the family who were vaccinated were asymptomatic. And that's good enough because you don't contract the severe form of disease. And that is is a good example to share with the non-medicals to encourage them and not just giving them posters and data, you know, because you, you should get vaccinated because COVID, <laughs> that's not good enough. You need to explain to them why it's important and it really makes a difference when it's coming from someone they know. Then perhaps tap into people who don't have access to healthcare. So uh, your house help, uh, your driver, your, um, your watchman, whoever is, not as privileged as you and someone you can reach out to because you meet them every day and you the, the security guard at your uh, house uh, or the your college your university ask them did they get vaccinated because people are people are ta targeting to the people who are online online there's a lot of information everyone's reading about yes we should get vaccinated everyone's sharing that but who is talking to the people who don't have access to who are not following the public health and research department page on instagram who are not following amsa international on twitter who is targeting that population and that's the population that's around us and that's the population we can talk to so when you see someone out on the market when you're driving by you see someone not wearing a mask give them the mask Ask them why they're not wearing the mask. Explain to them that they should wear the mask. If you see someone not washing their hands before eating or serving something in, in an unhygienic way, maybe talk to them politely about it. They might not listen. They might get very angry. But if they do listen, mission achieved. OK, thank you so much for your answer. Maybe we should proceed to the next question Absolutely. what kind of project okay what kind of project or campaign do you do you think is needed in this current global health issues current health issues globally so many if i if i let's start um, locally if i think of um, right now delhi situation we need rampant health campaigns that focus on covid and social distancing and proper vaccination strategies. I think a lot of changes required in terms of policy making and management that's severely lacking in terms of my other vaccination campaigns. A lot of planning is needed here. So that's something again here as medical students, where do we come in? Advocacy. We come in by raising awareness to people who we are in contact with. And then advice, also advice. At this point in time in my country, India, the healthcare professionals are hugely burdened and overworked and focusing on the needs of the pe people and patients who need urgent emergency requirement. As medical students, I may not be equipped with the right amount of knowledge or degree to pres give prescriptions and help themselves at the front line. However, I can help people around me. I can read up the right protocols for COVID management and educate my family or my neighbor who's recently, uh, you know, turned out to be COVID positive, and then act as a bridge between a prof health professional and that uh, lay person who does not have the medical knowledge. So that's at this level. If I talk about globally, what kind of a health campaign is necessary? I think at this time also, uh, 
we've come across beautifully in small ways like amsa indonesia's immunization campaign video and then the world helping india out in this time of need and india giving vaccine to 92 countries i think covid has somehow brought this global community of health together and the world realizes the problem the, the importance of public health and the global health so what are the important public health campaigns we need to work on is defined by the sdgs there are so many globally i cannot target it to one specific and at your level you can just start with one but at this point i just must appreciate the global community coming together for each specific uh, campaign which at this time would be immunization for covid okay there are so many yeah <laughs> true okay then <laughs> okay then let's open the question and answer session to the floor do you guys have any further questions yes please i think someone has uh, raised their hand please Ahad, i have one question yes Hi, please Ahad. go ahead please ask ahead oh, so much it was so informative session and i must pray that it was so practical that I got one question that uh, you said about so many things you do at your level as a global health enthusiast or as a medical or these things, um, but I want to just uh, while we are talking more about COVID and especially about India where the population is so great and there are so many barriers uh, to uh, to fill that like maybe suburban population and people not knowing and there's huge population as well and the healthcare system is not sophisticated as well. Uh, I want to know if you are taking the lead of India. Uh, for instance, you are taking lead of India. What would be your top three short-term goals, and what would be your top three long-term goals in such case? Uh, to know, compare this, like, that's a brilliant question. It sounds like I've been made the prime minister for a day, and I get to do whatever I want. <laughs> that's an exciting thought. Um, short-term goals. Um, short-term goals. Yes, that sounds great. So, short-term goal for me would be, uh, like I said, a lot of focus needs to be placed in management. Uh, while we have kickstarted our man, uh, vaccination drive and opened it to everyone above the age of 18, we don't have vaccines to vaccinate them. So that would be my primary focus, relocating all the resources towards development of vaccines. Also, a lot of the vaccines are, um, how do I say, not approved by the Indian uh, administration. Like Sputnik has not been there in the market, although it has been sent and we have access to it, but it's not been released in the market. At a point in time when we have shortage of vaccine and vaccination centers are going out of vaccine, vaccines altogether, releasing a third vaccine in the market when we already have Covishield and Covaxin. Those, so those are the two vaccines we're working with. So releasing Sputnik and even um, I think th there's a fourth vaccine also, the single dose uh, one, I think it's jo Janssen something that's also come out. So releasing that when it's already available to you sounds like a good way to start. That would be my short term goal. Secondly, uh, it would be not just, uh, so AIMS, uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences is one of the top institutes of India. It releases certain guidelines. And when it releases guidelines, you know that that's, that's authentic material. That's something you can refer to. I think it, uh, the, these kind of resources need to be more rampantly developed, not just in terms of um, for medical professionals, but for also general public who don't have access to doctors right now. The doctors are very busy dealing with patients who only they can manage. And a lot of the people who can be, uh, are just mild COVID cases, they can be uh, taken care of at home. So proper guidelines for that need to be released to the public so they don't panic and rush to the hospitals and in turn get more infected. They don't start hoarding resources like medicines and oxygen cylinders because that's not, that's, that's not what everyone needs. That would be my second short term goal. Thirdly, would be regarding something I just thought of is RT-PCR test. People are just misusing it, may I just add, and, and so many COVID tests. So I know even people, educated people I know, are just getting CT, uh, HRCT scans done for their lungs because I am COVID positive, so I must get it done. No, that's not, pos that's not important. Not every COVID pos positive patient needs an HRCT. So again, that comes on to educating not just the medical professionals with proper guidelines, but the now we need to educate the equip the, the normal common man with that information. Long term goals would be 
improving connections and communications, which we kind of did start by exporting vaccines to 92 countries and uh, not, not even, it was not selling vaccines. We kind of gifted vaccines. So that was a great global, you know, a step towards global health. So that would be something I would want to do, sharing resources in times of need. Then, so uh, that would be one of the things, let me think of the other global health. COVID, I can only think in terms of COVID right now. I hope that's not, I'm all COVID minded uh, because that's that's the problem my country is facing right now. So in terms yeah. of- uh, about COVID, what would be your top priorities about COVID? Because uh, yes. pandemics come over and we are not all the time prepared for the, these kind of pandemics. And that, that has took over even the developed countries as well. They were not able Absolutely. to combat that. And India being the developed country with huge population, it becomes a really difficult thing to tackle on. So uh, that, that was it. And then on, on a light, you know, I want to ask your personal opinion. Like you said about uh, you... Uh, quality or quantity and in this time like uh, the health like you said like uh, so that the healthcare workers are so or so like overwhelmed and they have been so overburdened by the work and also uh, about um, about the guidelines they are like uh, pushing interns and some funny medics in this uh, as a frontliners so what do what's your opinion like because they are not given the proper care and they are not given the security and what do you think would you risk your life over this issue or would you let it be? Because uh, if you're not getting your personal security and working as a frontline worker, what would you opt for? That's a brilliant question. Not just because it's so apt and relevant because it's happening right now. Also because that's something I did ponder myself last week. I have been thinking about volunteering in a, a re in a nearby health camp that has been set up by one of my professors, by Doctors For You. And at this point in time, I, I think we need to government needs to allocate all the resource it can get. In terms of manpower, I do understand them uh, bringing in the interns, the post interns and the final year students calling them in places. So while in um, a city like Delhi, while the notice has been out, my college has not called the final year students in actually all colleges of Delhi, because they have sufficient resources in terms of healthcare workers at the point in time. Maybe there does come a moment that the final years also need to be called in. But in res low resource settings where there's only one medical college and one hospital that's dealing with the burden of a lot of people, they run out of interns and post interns and graduates and then final years need to be called in. I do believe your uh, opinion completely when they need to be provided with some kind of a security, like maybe even residence and food and that would be sufficient, not even monetary, like just security so they don't go home and infect their families because that would be my biggest concern. So yes, absolutely, security needs to be provided. And I believe most of the places that are tapping into the population of medical graduates that are calling medical graduates in India are giving them some kind of security. So I did uh, check into that health camp I was talking about for Doctors For You, and they were providing accommodation, they were providing meals. So that's sufficient for one, one person and the proper PP kit and all of the mask and everything. So I think that basic need to be there before you call in everyone to come work at the front line. That, that needs to be there. But I do understand the need for uh, our country to call in all of its medical health, health resource, uh, resources in terms of manpower. This is the time of need. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for this intermediate session. All of your questions. I'm overwhelmed to hear the answers and the real quick scenario that you came across. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your questions. Was, those are great questions. Thank you so much for the questions, but sadly, I need to close the session for the Q&A for the second, the second session. And we hope that it was very informative and very um, insightful for all of you. So maybe we can proceed to the next session of the breakout room session in which the participants can rejoin their breakout rooms from their previous groups. And the participants can start to join the breakout room and begin with the cat with the case study worksheet one and further guidance will be given by the facilitators. Thank you so much, Ms. Sandriana, for the insightful presentation. Thank you, Lindita. Thank you everyone for being such a great patient audi audience. It's so exciting to see my PHRD people who are part of this. A lot of the uh, PHRD members were here.
I, I just yeah. read the comment section. They loved it. I, I'm sure everyone loved it as much as we did. The session was so interactive <laughs> and great. so interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sandhya. Thank you for inviting me, Kushman. So, Sandhya, also, I wanted to invite you for the certification ceremony and the photo ceremony tomorrow at the end of both the sessions, where we'll be presenting the special certificates to the speakers. So if you could make some time uh, for that, we'd be really, really glad. Otherwise, we'll also be mailing you the certificates. I would love to. I, I, I'm really enjoying this. I've enjoyed all our meetings together, but uh, this is the first training. Obviously, this is the first global health training. So this is good. Lovely. Thank you so much. Also, I'm just sharing with you the link of the uh, SGD case sheet that we have prepared uh, for the participants. Please let us know your thoughts in the same. Awesome. Are, are you texting me uh, on WhatsApp? Yes, yes. I'm just sending it over. For the ones who haven't yet been assigned to a breakout room, uh, please be patient, we're reassigning you. Currently, uh, we have assigned all the participants. So Shreya, Rifti, please, um, as well as Atharva, you can find uh, an option to join your breakout room. So I've already been assigned to a breakout room. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Shreya, uh, I think I can, uh, for the ones who are facing this problem, I can help you with reassigning you to the breakout room. So actually for the ones facing the problem, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the breakout rooms have been opened since the beginning. So you probably need uh, to figure out link. Yes, so because I can see that you have been already, otherwise I will have to move to a different breakout room for you to get that notification because the room that you've been assigned to has already been assigned to you. So I will try my best to reallocate you. Amit, have you not been yet able to join your breakout room? Atharva, can you please rename yourself? So that, um, or please let me know what breakout room are you in, what group are you in, so that I can allocate you to the room. Since you haven't uh, named yourself properly, let me check. Let me find out your breakout room otherwise. Okay. You're in group two, so I'll be assigning you to group two. Hello everyone, welcome back. This brings us to the end of, the, of day one of masterclass of global health. 
Thank you for joining and actively participate and your enthusiasm. We we'll look forward to seeing all, you all tomorrow. A small reminder, we have been noting the attendance throughout the session. So make sure that you not missing out tomorrow. We have an interesting array of activities and speakers lined up for you. Before closing up the session, let's have a photo session. Please, everyone turn on your camera so I can take a documentation. These objectives should explain the result you expect your program to have in the long term. Well-written long-term objectives, as you say, the SMART objectives should include uh, this subgroup or the target population, state the expected result or the change of the program. Third, should specify the degree of change in measurable terms. Fourth, should include when the change will happen. An objective that monitors progress of a program should contain these five elements. To help remember these elements, we'll use the acronym SMART. First, um, specific, which means it provides the who, that is the target population and persons doing the activity, and the what. So by what we mean, what action or activity are we doing? Uses only one action verb, since objectives with more than one verb imply that more than one activity or behavior is being measured. Second, that's measurable. Specifies how much change is expected. It is, it is impossible to determine uh, whether objectives have been met unless they can be measured, right? Then, sec uh, then third is that goes with A is achievable. That is it, can it be attainable within a uh, given and with the available program resources? The fourth is the relevant. Accurately, does it accurately address the scope of the problem and prog programmatic steps that can be implemented with its, within a specific time frame? And fifth, or the last, the T of the SMART objective is time bound. Specifies a time frame indicating when the objective will be measured or a time by which the objective will be met. Moving ahead to an interesting representation shared by one of my professors who states that a theory of change is a is a coagulation of four major processes. One, defining a problem tree. Second, defining an objective tree, both of which were covered by our speaker, Sondarya, yesterday. And third and fourth are the stakeholder mapping or the stakeholder analysis and the SWOT analysis, which we will be discussing ahead. So starting with first, the stakeholder mapping. So on the left, you see a graph, which has four columns. On the x-axis, uh, you see inference, and on the y-axis, you see position. So what do we mean um, when we talk about stakeholders? So stakeholders basically are people or organizations who are relevant to your project or program that you're planning. It's very important or mandatory to classify your stakeholders into four different categories. One, advocates, the people, who support or who advocate the cause you're working for. Second, the supporters. The su supporters will be the people who you think would be supporting your program. Third would be the critics. The critics would definitely be the people who are, def are who might not be on your side or in 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 lesson or in in relevance to your program, but are the people who are well well oriented and might might propose a problem or may support. So I will be giving examples ahead to ex help you explain better. Uh, but moving lastly to fourth, that is the blockers. Blockers would be the people who might not be in support of your health, pro health program or you know the project that you're planning for. So let's take an example. Let's say um, there is a project wherein you try uh, to work against the tobacco companies, advocate against the tobacco companies who are currently selling the tobacco products. So first let's begin with the supporters. Who would be supporters? Supporters would be organizations advocating for the same cause as you are. Um, that includes WHO, FCTC, as well as other relevant UN agencies who are working for the cause. Advocates uh, would be the people or the governments, I would say, who might support, would be the people or the organizations 
who work for the cause, who advocate against the use of tobacco. It could be some student organizations, some NGOs who might who might have been actively advocating or might might prove to be um, implemented uh, to, to your cause or to your project and could support your project in some sense. Third would be the critics. So the critics would actually be the governments. I'm sorry, I just uh, accidentally skipped them in the advocate section, but critics would be your governments in this uh, situation who might support or who might not support. So it would be very important to monitor the interest. And lastly would be the blockers. So obviously the, the tobacco companies that you're talking about would be the definite blockers um, who would you would need, who you cannot actually keep satisfied, I would say in this that particular project, but uh, to ensure that their in fact your program is minimalistic, you can take relevant steps. Now, this is what I've talked in stakeholders in the, excluding your target population. Within your target population itself, for instance, if you're targeting a group of young individuals, you can find all four of these categories very easily. You know, you some of you them will be supporters to your cause. Um, just not to go far, the, the volunteers that would be working for your project would definitely be the supporters who you would need to keep informed moving ahead in the project. Whereas advocates would be the people, um, you know, or the, the community members who might not be actively participating in your cause, but would have thoughts licensed or similar uh, to your cause. Critics, um, I would say, would be the people um, who might, critics and blockers in this situation would be the people who, you, who might have smoked or who might be actually smoking in the present. So for instance, let's say you would be advocating for um, an increase in the tax, uh, tax policies on the tobacco and the smoke sale of smoke products. So your definite blockers would be the people who smoke and the critics uh, would be the people who might have smoked or who might have instances or directions towards that. Okay, that explains this stakeholder mapping. It is uh, something that you will not be working on the case sheet that you get, but something that you will always need to think about when you're working on a project. It's a little bit difficult uh, to classify uh, your uh, stakeholders into these four categories. But trust me, if you have done this on a project, you will definitely be able to cater your program and your project accordingly. Moving over to the SWOT analysis. So SWOT analysis, as we already know, SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So when we talk about these, strengths and weaknesses are an internal mechanism of your program, of your organizing committee, and your team, which you very well know can be used to implement or to augment the cause of the program of the project. Whereas opportunities and threats are external forces, uh, whereas opportunities aim to provide a boost or support or uh, amplify your program, whereas threats are the potential problems which can lead uh, to a detrimental effect on or reduce the impact of your program. So that's, this is a little bit on the stakeholder mapping and SWOT analysis. Moving ahead to planning and intervention. Now that you know where, where are you headed, you know the program goal, the incremental steps you need to take there. You have your objectives, the obstacles that might get in the way. You have your stakeholder mapping and SWOT analysis. You're ready to develop an intervention. This involves four main tasks, I would say. First, determining a health strategy. Second, researching existing evidence-based interventions. What have the people or the organizations done in the past to solve the problem and what were the results? Comparing those interventions, for instance, you might get uh, four to five different strategies that have been used. So comparing the results of them to find an, a better solution is very important. And lastly, selecting an intervention to adapt or create. For instance, if you might find there's a one policy having um, significant results in the past, you might want to continue that same program or the strategy. Or you might see that uh, combining two strategies might lead to a better argument uh, results. So you might uh, look forward to creating a new intervention. So let's start with the, determining a health strategy. This is something that I'll be uh, touching upon. I believe the other three points are very well self-explanatory. So a health strategy is basically a general plan of action for affecting health problem. So there are three main types of strategies. One, uh, behavioral or educational. 
this the behavioral educational health strategy is something is that is the most relevant to us as medical students and as medical student organizations. And second and third are environmental and policy strategies uh, based on health. They hold a little bit re uh, lesser relevance in comparison to the behavioral or educational strategy. But yes, uh, if needed, um, they can be worked upon depending on the project. So health strategy, you identify, always remember that it must relate to the program goal the long-term objectives and the factors that are most important and modifiable. To have a significant impact, you may often need to identify a combination of health strategies, you know, as I earlier mentioned, at educational, behavioral, environmental, or policy levels. So first of all, let's touch in brief about the behavioral educational therapy. So this strategy is basically desi designed to change the awareness, knowledge, attitudes, and or behaviors of community members. It may be targeted towards the community as a whole or individuals. An example of a behavioral or educational strategy based on the priority contributing factor of knowledge is an advertising campaign about the dangers of secondhand smoke, if relating it a little bit to the case study that we have been working upon. Next, the environmental health strategy. So using this, uh, this type of strategy is basically used if you want to alter the physical or the social environment, if the uh, priority contributing factor, let's say, was access. An example of an environmental strategy could be to decrease the access by removing cigarette vending machines for, from public buildings. As I mentioned, you can advocate uh, for an environmental health strategy, but it, as medical students or medical student organizations, it is not directly in, under, under our control to get those vending machines, if I'm just talking about the example, to get those vending machines removed from the public areas to re reduce access. Third is the policy health strategy. So if policy strategy focuses on influencing change in the broader regulations, ordinances, rule enforcement, and decisions on resource distribution that may affect the contributing factors to a health problem. So let's say, just to give an example to you guys, how a policy health strategy looks like, if the priority a contributing factor was cost. An example of a policy strategy could be passing or increasing tobacco excise tax. And if the priority contributing factor was access, an example of a policy strategy could be prohibiting smoke in government buildings. As I've mentioned previously, the, the strategies number second and third, they ultimately to us as medical students, they come under strategy number one. We could advocate uh, for to the governments to the organizations for uh, strategies number two and three, whereas in order to directly influence a target population, strategy number one, that is the behavioral educational strategy, is the one that we can most effectively work upon. So I'll be touching a more, little bit more on this in detail. Okay, let's move to a um, behavioral model that is a Fox behavioral model, which has been developed by the Stanford University and it's being used as a starting point for organizing thinking by many organizations, as well as community projects by governments. So a fog behavioral model illustrates that behavior is a product of one, motivation, second, ability, and third, triggers. As you can see on x-axis, we have ability, and on y-axis, we have motivation, whereas triggers is something that falls within the graph. I will be explaining them step by step, but for you guys, I would recommend having a picture of this graph in mind. We'll be coming back to this uh, once we discuss all three uh, steps that is motivation, ability, and trigger separately. So yes, moving ahead to changing motivation. So first, that's very important and can be done at a level is changing the motivation. This is an example of the WHO campaign, which, st which stated that misuse of antibiotics puts us all at risk, explaining a little bit. Uh, on how does it do so. So when we talk about changing motivation, there are three aspects. That is the knowledge, attitude, and practices that we need to influence. Target having an idea or a survey on the knowledge, on the existing knowledge, attitude, and practices of your target population can help you define or uh, influence motivate their motivation in better sense, as well as in the previous slide, if you've seen, 
you could uh, categorize your population into a high motivation or a low motivation population, depending on the results you get from the knowledge, attitude, and practices in regards to your program. Okay, moving ahead to changing ability. So when we talk about ability, there are considerable number of factors that are involved. First of all, uh, simplicity. That's one. Uh, for instance, if you're expecting your population to behave in a certain way, if just we're, now that we're topic of, on the topic of tobacco and smoke, you want your population um, to reduce the use of smoke or the, the existing smokers to reduce or to um, prohibit or the ones who have not started to not start. So simplicity is one wherein you know reducing the barriers for performing a target behavior is very important. Second, time involved. For instance, if you're expecting um, your target population to accept uh, what you're proposing or, you're, or what you're trying to, to explain them or change their behavior, these are the factors which will affect or their, their ability as how difficult or how easy for it is uh, for them to do. For instance, if your um, intervention is simple, if it involves less amount of time, if it does not involve their money, the physical effects it has the brain scientists, for instance, overestimating how much everyday people want to think. Six, the social deviance. For instance, does your intervention ask people to go against the social norm, breaking the rules of the society? And lastly, that is the non-routine. Is it, is it something that you're asking them to do out of their routine that's not available, that's not um, in, into their routine? So this is something, uh, let's just to give an example, for instance, uh, there's currently a rising burden of NCDs. You might your intervention might focus on asking people to change their behavior and practice exercising for at least 30 minutes a day. So definitely it's simple. It involves only 30 minutes of the time. It does not involve money. It involves, um, I would say, good physical effect, improving their physical health. Fifth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Uh, I would say not say specifically sixth, but fifth and seventh could be the ones who, who might uh, you know, decrease the results on that ability scale. The brain cycles, they might think that uh, they might not want to do the exercise or overthink the exercise. They might think it's not a part of their routine. And social levels could be in the sense because in some conservative families where an exercise may be considered um, a, a, a social norm, as I've heard in, in a few regions around India. That's the second part of it, changing ability. And third is a trigger. So trigger, as you as you saw on, on the graph itself, so trigger was one catalyst, as, as the word suggests. That's the catalyst that works with them. So this uh, figure that you see, there was a, a research done in the US wherein they found out uh, that people tend to uh, be positive towards health outcomes and towards their health routines. At the start, beginning of the week, where, you know, at, uh, for instance, on a Monday, they would want to start an exercise routine. They would try to commit smoking, start a diet, and to call us, get, uh, call us to schedule a doctor's appointment. Whereas uh, on the consecutive days, that motivation kind of dies down, as you can see on the graph. So what many of the projects or companies in USA did, um, even the government, they started targeting Monday as a day to motivate their campaigns or direct the campaigns towards the people to influence the behavior change, right? We could, we, as we can see on the graph, Monday is the day when people are actually thinking about it in comparison to the other days. So thus, they, they plan the implementation targeting people on Mondays. As you can see, considerable number of examples, Healthy Monday, Meatless Monday, De-Stress Monday, which focuses on mental health, Man Up Monday, Move It Monday. So depending on the project, the, um, they, they checked, uh, uh, they first surveyed the motivation of the population. As we can see, the motivation is on a Monday. Then they check the ability. They saw that these are the four things that people actually want to do. So there's, there's the scope of the project, ability. And third, that the trigger or the catalyst that they needed is how they targeted things on a Monday. And that helped them gain the maximum impact on their project. Okay, moving ahead to the EAST framework of behavior change. So now that we've discussed how it is done, so whenever you're planning a behavior change strategy, there are four things that, that you should always think about. First, make your strategy easy. Harness power of defaults, reduce the hassle factor of taking up a service and simplify your messages. 
Second, make it attractive. Attract attention. Design rewards and sanctions for maximum effect. You know, for instance, you could make them run for a goal or a keep keep up with uh, plan plan with a partner to you know get them some social rewards which could motivate them to to pursue a behavior change initially. Third, make it social. Show that most people perform the desired behavior. Use the power of networks. And lastly, encourage people to make a commitment to others. For instance, it has been shown by research uh, projects in the US that people tend to follow activities of behavior change together. Um, just to an example, for instance, two friends might uh, might might think together. Let's let's quit smoking. Let's prompt people when they are likely to be most receptive. For instance, let's I, I just uh, targeted Monday. Uh, there could be similar different examples for you know the kind of the behavior change that you might be wanting. Second. Consider the immediate costs and benefits. Benefits. Consider, make people understand how, in terms of the cost of the money, will the behavior change benefit them? For instance, if you're asking them um, to practice exercising, as a simpler example, we know that they're cutting down on the future costs on uh, getting those health treatments, and you know, um, difficult life, or I would say a, a sick. Uh, rather than being sick and paying for the hospital bills, they could save or cut down on many of them, as well as have better um, uh, life ahead. You know, and rather than having the severely adjusted uh, life years, it it could considerably cut down on that. So making them understand in clear, simple words would be very important. And lastly, help people plan their response to events. Help people understand that now that they have they have the information to how to change the behavior, how can they keep doing it? How can they keep staying motivated? How can they keep continuing what they want to do? So that's something that's very important. Okay, now that we've talked about behavioral change, let's talk about developing an implementation plan. Now that you have the roadmap, you already have a roadmap of how you will address your health problem, right? You have you've designed your strategy, you've determined your strategy and your intervention. Now you will need to plan how the program will be implemented. For this, one would be identifying and addressing potential barriers to implementation. So this would include um, your critics or blockers to the project and the stakeholders, and in SWOT analysis, the potential threats that you would need to redefine. Second would be developing a work plan to ensure you achieve the objectives. It's very, very important. And thirdly, developing a communication plan between your teams to ensure project members and stakeholders are kept informed. For these purposes, you can use um, charts like Gantt chart, et cetera. So developing a work plan is a tool you can use to achieve your objectives within the time frame specified. If you have a work plan determined, it will help you reduce time as well as make the team be present um, and be on the project at the, within the time frame itself and be well informed. So developing a communication plan helps you um, to communicate progress within your project members, as well as if you have any potential partners, keeping them informed will keep them uh, as your potential supporters or advocates of the project. As, as they start losing out on information, they might, they might turn out to be critics or might, might lose out interest on your project. So that is something that's again, very important. And lastly, uh, plan for evaluation. While you're planning and designing the program, you should also be planning for evaluation. Evaluation is measuring the, the actual, you know, what is really happening and comparing it to the intended, what we want to happen. So for instance, when you started the project, you had a, you had a vision in mind that these are the end goals that you want for your project. So now that your project is running, you need to make sure that you compare those, um, as I said, the intentions that you had and the actual outcomes of the project. That's something that's very important. There's a considerable set of questions that you need to ask. Is it um, is the progress going in terms of uh, the expectations? Is um, is the benefit comparable to the resources? For instance, you might feel that the the resources or the implementation of this uh, undertaken to pursue this project is much more than the benefits achieved. 
then you might need to reevaluate your strategies or look forward to a different strategy. So these are a few steps that you will need to um, to plan while you're initially with after the implementation plan itself before you actually um, start running your project full through. And once you're running it, you definitely need to continue the evaluation until the end of the project to make sure that the resources are used in a timely manner and the resources uh, and the project is progressed as expected. So this, uh, this exercise you will also be doing in the last case study worksheet uh, while you'll be closing on in the project. So we'll be, we will be able to understand these questions better. So I think this brings it to the end of my session. And yeah, I would like to give the stage back to Will. Thank you so much, Kush. That's a very comprehensive presentation explaining from the very beginning till the very end on how to plan public health projects. So now we are, we are going to the Q&A session and we already have a few of our participants who have filled in their questions in the registration forms. So we would like to bring that up forward, but for those who already have questions, please don't be shy. You may use the chat box down below or raise your hands later on after this series of questions. So the first question, Kush, what is an effective and reliable way to hold a campaign as well as crowdfunding when your nonprofit organization is not well established yet? So as I just mentioned, first of all, it's very important to plan your resources timely manner. You need to have an adequate idea of your resources. As you just mentioned, that your NGO is not well established. So you need to narrow down what resources do you have. Second, you need to, you need to write down what are your objectives. Then compare the gap. For instance, these are the resources that you have. This is what you're aiming for. There's definitely going to be a considerable gap in what you have and what you're aiming for. So how will you bridge that gap? Now, in order to bridge that gap, Look for stakeholders that can help you augment or bridge that gap and reach your goal. You could, uh, these could be organizations working for a similar cause, potential sponsors, potential partners. Look, first narrow down those, those partners or sponsors that, that could help you bridge that gap. And second, you need to understand, it's very important, that why would those partners or sponsors join or align your project? is when you have a clear plan in mind. Specifically for partners, you have well-defined goals, objectives, and implementation plan. The role of that stakeholder in your project, how would they be involved, uh, very spe clearly specified. Whereas for sponsors who might be funding your project, you need to explain to them the benefits that they would be getting out of this project. For instance, if it's a business company, they might, and you are going for a social cause, supporting that cause would help uh, the social image of that company, you know, market their brand better. So explaining it to them, having their logo in, incorporated in your advocacy sessions or in your advocacy posters and your campaigns is something that you need to be very clear and specific about. Once you're specific and clear to your, this, this potential partners or stakeholders uh, who can potentially support your project, that, that is the moment you will be able to bridge that gap between your objectives that you have delimited and uh, already designed and the resources that you have. That's when you will be able to host that project successfully in terms of campaigning as well as crowdfunding. That's very nice, Kush. I can see a lot of people nodding. <laughs> Thank you for your very detailed answer. And this relates to the next question. How do we choose the stakeholders that are eligible to advocate for our causes? Okay, so there's an interesting way um, I have worked on in this on on the stakeholder aspect. It's not related to this project, but this this project that I've been working upon that's called Immunize, wherein it aims to augment uh, transportation scheduling and reminders for the catch up vaccinations as well as vaccinations for children um, starting off with US and going on. So while we were working on that project, um, we were really concerned about, you know, finding those adequate stakeholders because a few of us were not even based in the US currently. So how did we overcome that barrier? So we started off with first defining, as I just mentioned, our objectives as clarifying what we expected or what was our vision, our, our long-term vision or long-term objectives out of this project. Once we did that, then we started on to find out, to research 
on various platforms as to who are the organizations, who are the potential partners, governmental organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations or companies who have been working for a similar cause or who we might think can you know, support our project. So there was a variety of organizations involved. For instance, uh, while we're talking about vaccination, we had CDC, you know, we thought about CNN, who could actually promote our project. So this, these are the few examples that we use. You know, we used a method of incentivization. So we thought about local, um, local groceries, local, ph local pharma, pharmacies, et cetera, to support a project, you know, to get that local outreach that we needed for a project. So that's how you define, you delineate, you delineate your um, one vision, as I mentioned, once you have defined your problem statement, you define your objectives. And under those objectives, just delineate the points as to what are your expectations. When you think of an objective, you need to be a little bit clarified on what do you expect out of, you know, what the, does the stakeholder need to do in your project? Or what are you expecting out of that stakeholder? Once you know what you're expecting out of them or expecting out of a partnership, it is easier to delineate or to choose those stakeholders. Um, I hope that answers the question, yeah. And that really answers the question. I totally agree with you, Kush. Nice. So last question from the list is, since the theme of this master class is essentials of organizing public health projects, I would like to ask if there is any specific method that is the most appropriate to ensure that even after the project ends, the values of it will still remain and keep on going without having to be directly monitored. Okay. I think that that took quite a considerable part of my presentation during the session. And my answer to that would be behavioral change. So that the reason why is I was stressing upon it is because behavioral change is something that if you have been effectively able to target or monitor uh, during your project, it will lead to a long-term influence without you having to monitor uh, the results of that project. If, you, if it's done in the right manner adequately for your target population, you will not need to continue monitoring that, um, what I would say, your target population or the group of individuals you're expecting on to. Because once, um, as I have seen in the previous public, health projects in my vicinity. Knowledge is something that we definitely impart, but not being able uh, to address those adequately, making, you know, making what you're telling is just, if just referring back to the EAST framework, easy, attractive, simple, and timely, not explaining them, you know, in detail, the benefits um, of why should they go for the behavior change, as I just said. And first of all, changing ability, motivation, and triggers if you're not able to cater the behavior change in the right manner. And something that's something that we can do best as medical students, since we do hold a considerable amount of the community's trust being healthcare professionals. So if you're able to augment the behavioral change strategy for your project in a very progressive and right manner, the, you would not need to monitor your, the results of your public, your project, even after the project is rendered, it would stay on. It would, you know, you, you would have made an impact that would stay on with your target population or with your community that you uh, presented the project to or you did the project with. Awesome. Thank you, Kush. So now we'll be opening the floor to the audience. Do we have any additional questions from all of our participants? Please feel free to type into the Zoom chat or raise your hand and we'll allow you the floor to verbalize your question. While we wait um, for questions, I just wanted to, to read out aloud what Marjorie, uh, she has very beautifully said in the chat box, think local and optimize what you can offer and obtain as a student, as I just mentioned. Second, do not overstress because of ambitious objectives, rethink and reset. So just to adding one on one of my previous answers, for instance, as I mentioned, there might be a gap and we are looking for a bridge, which is the stakeholders, but helping you augment your project and reach that objectives. But let's say in a, in a worst case scenario, the bridge is, is broken, or just, just being funny about it, or is it, is, it's not still your objectives. So if that is happening, what you need to do is to rethink and reset your objectives. You need to redefine your project. It's, 
it's of no use for us to waste the resources right for you to waste your or exhaust your existing resources to obtain objectives that might not be possible so if that bridge uh, of stakeholders is not being um, made or you know you're not able to get relevant stakeholders or um, i would say partners to your project it's totally fine if you do not overstress and rather rethink and reset so yeah thank you so much marjorie for sharing that with all of us Thank you, Kush. Thank you, Marjorie. So because we do not have any questions, we'll then proceed to the, our next agenda, which is the first SGD of the day. All right. So I believe you are all quite familiar already with your groups by now. So for now, please kindly rename yourself again as group number underscore name underscore AMSA chapter. And we'll go to the breakout rooms and come back after 30 minutes of discussion. Best of luck to all of you. We will be now allocating you to your breakout rooms. Please join them as soon as you're assigned to them. Thank you. The breakout rooms have been opened, so kindly join your breakout rooms. Um, I see this, Annette, uh, I remember from yesterday you're from group five, so I will assign you to group five. The rest everyone has been assigned as of now. Kindly join your breakout rooms. Okay, hello everyone, welcome back. I hope you all had a great great discussion session with your group mates and facilitator and a fun session for those who joined us earlier <laughs> okay so now we will move on to our second session for today and the final session of this master class which is the essential of planning public health project stage three advocacy and this will be delivered by our guest speaker adriana viola miranda so a little bit about her, she's the co-founder of Students Against COVID, probably something that you are all familiar with and you all have seen everywhere in the social media. So Students Against COVID is a global grassroots movement aiming to bring students and young professionals together to create a common platform to create awareness about COVID-19, share ideas and collaborate in tackling the pandemic. This movement currently has 1000 plus volunteers from 100 plus countries around the world and has won several awards including the pollination project prize dice innovation challenge and most recently has been awarded the cugh pulitzer high impact award and most importantly she is also a member of amsa so now i invite miss adriana to the stage the floor is yours thank you Valia, and other uh and amsa international for the opportunity uh let me share my screen So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. 
yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thank you once again for AMSA International for inviting me. Uh, I'm Adriana Vela Miranda. I'm a member of AMSA Indonesia. Currently, I'm the final year medical student at the University of Indonesia. And as uh, Felia have introduced, I'm I'm one of the co-founders of Students Against COVID. So here's a bit about Students Against COVID. Actually, Felia has introduced uh, about this as well. So Students Against COVID or SAC is a youth-led global grassroots movement currently comprising of students and young professionals from um, 10 countries, uh, sorry, 100 countries. And um, we started as a movement of only um, eight people from six countries. And uh, beginning with our inception in March 2020 until now, we've now grown into uh, a movement where people from all over the world uh, collaborated and sharing awareness about COVID-19. And um, the Students Against COVID movement not only comprises medical students, but also uh, students from other majors like design students, communication students, etc. And most recently we won this uh, award. It's from the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, which is the biggest um, consortium in global health worldwide. One of the keynote speaker uh, in 2021 is Dr. Anthony Fauci from the United States. And yeah, so I would like to introduce you all to advocacy. I will divide the presentation into two. The first section will be about uh, theories about advocacy. And the second part will be more of um, examples of what SAC has been doing uh, this past year um, to increase awareness about COVID-19, both for the general public and also for uh, policymakers. So I would like to start this presentation by uh, stressing that in order to promote behavioral change, we need to um, acknowledge that someone's behavior is influenced not only by his or her own belief, but also by the factors um, um, by the factors that is environment or, and also um, policies, etc. So if we want to change one's behavior, we also need to address um, and influence change in their work environment and their uh, communities, etc. And that's where health advocacy comes in. So health advocacy is actually defined differently across literatures. Some of the literature explained that health advocacy is mainly targeted towards uh, influencing policies, while others use uh, health advocacy and campaign interchangeably. In this uh, lecture, we're going to follow the WHO's um, definition of health advocacy, which as you can see here is the combination of individual and social actions designed to gain political commitment, policy support, social acceptance, and system support. So the two key points here is that health advocacy is not only for gaining political commitment, but also to uh, increase social acceptance towards a cause or issue. And um, if you see in this diagram, there are many aspects that we can approach to uh, induce social change. And all of these approaches are included as health advocacy. So um, health advocacy is one of the uh, fields of the health communication. So health communication is any activities which, um, which is in full communication of health within a community. Uh, aside of advocacy, it also involves maybe campaigning and also health education between doctors and patients, etc. cetera. And um, what, why am I stressing this is because in order for you to um, plan your advocacy, you need to use health communication strategies. So if you see uh, this diagram, this is the health communication program cycle beginning with the planning and strategy development, uh, and then to developing concepts, message, and materials, implementing the problem, and lastly, addressing effectiveness and making refinements. Uh, and for the first step, uh, I believe that we should divide it further into two steps. So um, 
firstly, you need to identify your cause. What problem are you looking forward to solve? And also uh, identify your intended audience, which I will explain more. So the first one is to, uh, the first step is to identify your cause. Um, my tip to identify the right cause for you is to look within yourself first. So you can do a reflection uh, about your standing in the community. How do you feel about your community? What things do you think is a problem and um, something you would like to solve? And um, after that, uh, you can go to the community to learn if your concern is also the concern of other people. Because uh, of course we know that our own concern cannot always be generalized to the whole population. And the way to know if that problem is also other people's problem is by um, looking in primary resources or secondary resources. Uh, you can also do both, of course. So for primary resources, you can uh, do surveys or focus group discussions um, because now it's still in, we're still in pandemic, you can do it online with Google Forms, Zoom, etc. And uh, you can also uh, validate your concern by looking at research and news reports. And after that, after you identify uh, the, your problem and also uh, maybe think about some of the way to um, solve that problem, the next step is to plan your advocacy. So advocacy, uh, the slogan for advocacy is sending the right message to the right audience in the right place or medium or channel at the right time. So I will explore more about our right message and right time later. Uh, so for this slide, I will focus more on uh, identifying the right audience and the right medium. Uh, so for identifying your right audience, you need to um, look at the stakeholders first. I believe that Kush has explained this more about identifying uh, your stakeholders. But uh, the, uh, the point I would like to make is that in every problem, for every cause, there is different stakeholders. And uh, for different stakeholders, uh, the message should be different. And also the channel for which you are trying to send a message to. Um, so identifying the right audience is important because only then you will be able to identify the right channel and the right message. Um, as for audience, you can um, you can address general public and you can also specify uh, their demographics. Are you targeting age groups um, like youth or older people? and also maybe uh, specific genders, anything that suit the problem you're trying to uh, raise awareness for. Or um, for example, uh, if you are trying to address uh, a cause about menstruation, then maybe you can target a female youth more. Um, and as for you choosing the right channel, um, after you identify the audience, you can um, you can pick the right channel for the right audience. So, for example, if you are trying to influence youth, you can use social media such as Instagram, TikTok, etc. But if you're trying to address older people, then Facebook would be the right choice. For policymakers, you can. Um, send them open letters or um, setting up meeting with them. And you can also maybe conduct some seminars for the general public or for professionals for your advocacy. And um, I believe that Kush has explained about this as well, but uh, I, this framework is also important for developing advocacy materials. So, ease framework is one of uh, behavioral economic strategies, which is, um, so behavioral economics is a study about psychological behavior 
and how people um, pers how people act on um, programs and policies, something like that. And um, for advocacy, um, in order for your message to be easily understood, you need to follow this framework as well. So firstly, you need to make it easy. Uh, you need to make your message as simple as possible. But one thing to note is that simple differs between audiences. So for example, if you're trying to address uh, school children, then maybe simple really means simple, uh, like simple words and, um, you know, the words we use daily. But maybe if we are trying to address policymakers, simple would mean higher um, words with higher difficulties. Um, and another way to enter your advocacy is easy to understood is to reduce the hassle. So you need to reduce uh, the intended audience access barrier to your advocacy. For example, if you are using social media for advocacy, maybe it's better to make your account unprivate rather than make it locked only for your followers. Um, the second one for advocacy is to ensure your advocacy is attractive um, so because people are more inclined to follow something if they are attractive. And to ensure its attractiveness, um, you, need, you can use infographics. Um, so I strongly suggest you to um, collaborate with design students or designer. Um, because they know best about how to implement um, colors and images that would be um, that would be attractive to your audience. Another way to attract attention is by um, being emotional. You can um, you can use a story, an emotional story, as the basis of your advocacy. For example, the UNICEF is known for uh, using images of refugee children to show just how in dire situation they are currently. And they are trying to ask for uh, more funding using that story uh, because it attracts attention and also uh, emotional attachment of the audience. You can also use three words, but uh, remember to use three words wisely because if you use three words like giving money or gifts, in every message you're trying to give, then the message can lose its intended meaning because for every message, uh, there are rewards. So then people will stop thinking it as important. So use rewards for things that you think is the most crucial in your advocacy. And uh, the next uh, tip for advocacy is to make it social. Uh, people are more inclined to follow something that is uh, also followed by everyone else, especially everyone in their community. So for this, you can make uh, advocacy or campaigns that um, show others that their friends are following the intended behavior change as well. For example, um, SAC recently conducted a vaccine campaign where people can share their experience about uh, their vaccination in their stories uh, by tagging us and then uh, explaining in one sentence why they vaccinate and post it in their social media. Uh, that way, their followers will be able to know that when uh, their friends are vaccinated, in. And uh, secondly, uh, they also know that uh, vaccination is important uh, because um, their friend is telling them why they vaccinate. Uh, another way to make it social is by um, um, by partnering with other organizations because uh, even if we did our research about a certain audience we would like to target, uh, there are always um, obstacles and cultural norms that are maybe only known by the people in that area. For example, um, 
when we are addressing a specific population, maybe in a rural area, it's best to collaborate with the community health workers there because they know best about uh, their cultural norms that maybe is different with us and they also can uh, speak in their own languages that maybe we don't really know. And lastly, uh, we need to also make the advocacy timely. Uh, so by this, um, the advocacy needs to be delivered when it is in the right opportunity. Um, so for example, if, um, if you are trying to address policymakers, it's best to um, make appointment for meetings near the um, near their convention or near their meeting because then the issues you're the issue you're trying to bring will have some relevancy for them um, and you also need to help uh, your internet audience to plan responses um, for example you, if you are trying to um, increase uh, the PPA usage in your community. Maybe you can help with fundraising uh, so that every people in your community can uh, have PPE. And you can also devise strategies. So in long term, you, your community will no longer be um, dependent on such fundraising to be able to use uh, PPE. And uh, lastly, uh, before you implement your uh, project, you also need to make a, um, several evaluation indicator, um, which directly uh, correspond to your goals. Uh, for this, you need to ensure that you focus on both quantitative and qualitative indicators because um, <clears throat> both of them have differ, uh, di different strength about how they can help evaluate your advocacy. So, uh, for the first one, quantitative indicators can show you how many people saw your campaign. So this can be used to evaluate uh, the channel you are using. Maybe uh, if, for example, if you are uh, posting in Instagram and then uh, when you compare two posts, uh, the other posts have uh, significantly lower views than your previous campaigns. Maybe there's something wrong with um, the way you post it, maybe the message is not as attractive as before, or maybe uh, the problem is with your uh, posting time. So in many ways, advocacy is like marketing. So you should also uh, evaluate that by knowing um, the best time to post and how to make it attractive. Um, quantitative indicators can also be used to evaluate uh, how many people actually uh, change their behavior after uh, you start the advocacy, or how many uh, policies are uh, are being um, are being endorsed by the policymakers after your advocacy. Um, but there's the um, but there's a disadvantage of only using the quantitative indicator, especially uh, as the uh, way you evaluate how people change their behavior. Um, and this is especially for uh, social media campaigns because uh, there's this phenomenon called clicktivism where people would just click something and maybe say they support something without actually being invested in the cause you're trying to bring. And that's where the qualitative indicator comes in uh, for you to evaluate your um, advocacy more thoroughly and to know the actual impact of your uh, advocacy. So uh, you can know that uh, from qualitative uh, evaluation, how people are being impacted on um, how, for example, if you are trying to increase uh, PPE uh, usage in your community, maybe uh, you can ask the people how often they use um, their PPE and 
uh, how it helps, how the uh, advocacy materials help them understand better about it and how it can, how it help them uh, share it to their uh, neighbors and family so that more people use PPE, something like that. And the qualitative indicators can also be used for you to understand whether your message is easily understood and whether your message is remembered. Because in advocacy, we want people to remember, not only to understand at the given moment, but also to remember it so that they will use and follow the behavior sustainably. And uh, to reach more people, uh, based on my experience, there are three tips. The first one is to engage in translation projects. Uh, this is especially important if your uh, intended audience speak uh, multiple languages. Uh, for example, here in Indonesia, we use, um, many of us are actually uh, speaking Indonesian as our second language. And so by addressing our local languages, by using local languages in our um, um, advocacy materials, we can help uh, reach wider population because uh, there's studies that show that um, um, speaking in our first language engage us more emotionally than the other, uh, the second or third language. And uh, you can also engage in partnerships because once again, the uh, NGOs in your uh, in the area you're targeting maybe are more familiar with the right way to advocate to their communities. And you can also promote your uh, activities through communication media, such as um, maybe Instagram ads or um, mass media like TV shows or news. And uh, one last thing I would like to stress before going to the examples is that advocacy is a long-term action. And for that, you need to manage your people uh, or your team well uh, to ensure that you can sustainably uh, get your team to advocate for the causes you, um, you are trying to bring. And for that, the tip is to choose causes that are relevant for, to everyone, because that way uh, more people will be uh, able to relate to the cause. And not only will uh, your current team be, um, be supportive toward the cause, you can also recruit more people. Um, and periodically, you should also share the results of your campaign to your team, because that way, uh, they can know that they are actually doing something, that their efforts are impacting people. And lastly, you can also appreciate team efforts by giving them awards or gifts. And so this is advocacy within SAC. So this is our model. We are trying to address uh, not only the micro level or individual awareness, but also uh, meso level and macro level interventions. Um, so in micro level, we are doing awareness campaigns, uh, which includes translated materials. And also we conducted several virtual events like trainings and competitions uh, for, uh, um, for increasing population awareness and mobilization. We do several regional initiatives. Uh, currently we have one in Detroit and also uh, we're working for more activities in Indonesia, Pakistan, etc. Here we do PPE donation and fundraising. And while we focus more on meso and micro level intervention, we also try to advocate uh, policymakers by uh, sending open letters uh, in collaboration with other partners, as well as publishing several academic articles and uh, journals. So this is our COVID-19 campaigns. We try to increase our credibility by also uh, inviting professors to speak in our events. And we also uh, make several flyers in collaboration with our uh, design team from design major to make it interesting. Um, so we pay attention in the color uh, and the number of text in the, in the flyer to make it interesting. And we also translate it to several languages and disseminate it to um, uh, healthcare workers and also community health workers all across the world. We also try to uh, be more um, 
relatable for youth uh, by making uh, flyers like this. So this is like message bubbles uh, that we imagine can be saved uh, to each other by youth. Uh, so here we practice nudge. So we try to um, um, influence people by only giving them like small, um, um, small trigger. Uh, and that, so if you are reading this, maybe it will seem like just like other Tumblr posts, but, with, but then after you read it, you will realize that uh, this is something about COVID-19. And uh, as a part of our strategy to also be relatable to youth, we also conducted several uh, TikTok campaigns and um, some video uh, in YouTube. So um, we tried to write the names of our countries to show youth that many people across the world do the right thing during COVID-19. Um, so in this campaign, we would like to stress that um your community is also doing it so you should do so it's like the make it social uh strategy of the is framework and we also uh try to engage more and attract more attention by in, um doing several podcasts with uh covid-19 sur survivors so we can have a more engaging story by being more emotional um and this is our vaccination campaign. Uh, it's similar with the COVID-19 campaign. We also do some skill development and fundraising programs. Um, and lastly, uh, we do the open letter. We send open letter to the G7 recently uh, in collaboration with uh, several of these organizations. Um, so this is why partnership is important because with partnership, you can also engage with um, Policymakers, especially because we are still students, so uh, engaging in policy make with policymakers uh, is maybe harder than if we are already professionals. And to ensure sustainable uh, action within the community, we also engage in promotions with in mass media, in TV shows, podcasts, and also uh, several news articles. This one is from UNICEF. And uh, lastly, we also do several member appreciation posts um, just to remind them that we are very thankful for their effort in um, ensuring that our advocacy is sustainable within their own uh, countries. So uh, thank you. This is uh, the references I use in making this presentation. Uh, you can contact me if there is any questions, but of course, after this, there's this Q&A section, but uh, if it's not answered during the time, or if you are not sure on what to ask now, but you want to ask me later, you can contact me and email LinkedIn or in Instagram. So thank you very much. And I hope it's insightful for all of you. Thank you so much, Miss Adriana, for the insightful presentation. And so we'll proceed to the Q&A session where we already received around four questions from our registrants in the registration form. So the first question is, what is the role of advocacy for planning some public health projects and why is it important? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. I believe advocacy is very important because that, um, that's the way you can show the public you that's the way you can influence the public and policymakers to also um take part in your public health programs as i have said that in promoting behavioral change we need to consider that we uh, health is not only influenced by individual factors but also by other factors uh in our community including a work environment, school environment, our families, and also our policies. So by doing advocacy, we can ensure that our public health programs can achieve success because we are trying to intervene in every aspect of one's life. 
Thank you. That's a very, very nice answer. And I hope it answers the question for those who have submitted it. So now let's proceed to the next question. The question is, how to make an impactful public health campaign during the pandemic? Do you have any tips and tricks? Okay, um, so I have several tips. The first tip is to, um, I think it follows what I explained in the presentation. So the first one is to ensure that the cause you're trying to bring is relevant to many people. Because uh, during the pandemic, uh, people are facing so many costs, uh, so many problems, so many issues, and uh, the way to uh, be impactful is firstly to attract people, and the way to attract people is to uh, to have causes that are relevant to many people, and then to be impactful, you also need to have uh, a campaign or an advocacy that is uh that have a measurable goal and for so um you need to be clear at the beginning of your um planning what goal are you trying to achieve because uh impactful is a big word it can mean everything but in order to make that impactful be more uh be clearer you need to make and devise uh better indicators that can show um, and later for your evaluation uh, you can know that whether your um, program is impactful or not and uh, you can um, okay so the other tip from me is that um, you need to um, I think I would like to stress about Marjorie's uh, message before that you should optimize what you can do as student because I believe this is being asked by student. Um, if we are trying to be very impactful, maybe for example, to a global level, it will be something that is achievable, but it may be, um, you know, it may be challenging. And in doing so, we will not be able to enjoy the process of doing advocacy, but uh, enjoyment in doing so is actually crucial because that way you can um, you can ensure your program can be sustainable because that way uh, because by being uh, happy about what you're doing, um, even when you face challenges, uh, you will be uh, more um, what you will be. Um, more motivated, I guess, to solve it. And uh, lastly, the tip from me is to once again um, promote your actions in communication media because it always works. Uh, if you, uh, if your movement is being uh, important in news channels or TV shows, people will see more uh, credibility in your campaigns, and that can help a lot. And people being more uh, attracted to your campaign and be more in full. But yeah, I guess uh, the most important thing is still enjoy the campaign, focus more on uh, trying to be impactful instead of uh, being impactful only. I'm not sure if it's right, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hope it answers the question. And good yes. luck with the advocacy. Yes, I do think enjoyment is very, very important. And the next question, I find it very interesting and I'm curious about it as well. During this pandemic, um, majority of the campaigns are about COVID-19, but however, uh, it is, there's no doubt that there are still other urgent matters to be discussed or other matters, other diseases, other focus health areas that needs to be brought to the surface. So what are your thoughts on how to deliver the cam a campaign or an awareness um, project to bring out something that is urgent but yet overshadowed by the overwhelming COVID-19 issue? That's a nice question. Uh, we also do this in SAC. So in SAC, we not only focus on the um, 
COVID-19 related issues, but also uh, the issues being impacted by COVID-19, uh, like antimicrobial resistance or uh, women's health issues. I think uh, based on my experience, you can start by, um, by showing how your uh, intended issue is being impacted by COVID-19. For example, uh, one of our campaigns was about um, refugees and we show that uh, refugees are now in more dire situation now that's, uh, that COVID is happening and more and more resources are target are not uh, being directed by them. Uh, that way you can attract people's attention because they will realize that in the pandemic, the, um, so like the pandemic is not the only problem. After that, uh, you can uh, of course explain a bit more about the issue you're trying to give. And um, yeah, but the main point is that you should start by the COVID-19 impact to the um, cost because uh, by doing that, you can attract people. That's a good tip. Thank you so much, Ms. Adriana. So last question in the list before we open it up to the forum is what is the difference between campaigning and advocating for a cause that you're most passionate about? I believe I addressed this in the PowerPoint presentation. So there are uh, two different opinions about this. Uh, one is that advocacy um, is more about influencing political uh, political commitment and political awareness about an issue or a cause, while advocacy is, I'm sorry, while, while campaigning is more about increasing public awareness. But um, actually the other opinion stated that advocacy and campaign can be used interchangeably and that um, that definition is being used by the WHO. So I believe it can be used interchangeably. Thank you very much for your answers. Okay, uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Don't be shy, you may use the chat feature below or raise your hand to verbalize your question. We'll give it one minute. This is a good opportunity to ask one of our well-known <laughs> people in AMSA who is very involved in advocacy and campaigns and a lot of public health matters really. So it's a good opportunity guys. So don't be shy, I'll count to 10. If no one is asking question, then we'll proceed to the agenda, okay? <laughs> Okay, no one is asking questions. All right, so I guess that means everything is very, very clear. So thank you very much, Ms. Adriana, for the wonderful and interesting session. And now we'll move on to the final part, which is we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to all of you by presenting the certificates of appreciation. So one second. Uh, sorry, Bailey, you are muted. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, Miss Adriana, for your time and also your very insightful session. And I'm pretty sure it has helped and inspired many of us here to continue on being impactful medical students. All right. So we'll take a screenshot. Uh, can anyone help me, um, Marjorie? Okay. Okay. I'll be the photographer of the day. Let's go. I'm done. Okay. So I'm quite slow in this, but I'm trying my best. Please bear with me. Thank you. Okay, so three, 
two, one smile. Okay, we'll take one more. Three, two, one smile. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So now we'll present the next certificate of appreciation to our first speaker, our beloved Director of Global Health, Kush. Okay. One second. Oh, I feel like a boomer. Give me one second. <laughs> Okay. I'll push on spotlight. Okay, so Kush, thank you very much for arranging such a nice masterclass and for sharing your knowledge in public and global health. It is very much appreciated and great job. <laughs> okay, so now we'll take a picture. Okay, smile, nice hair. Okay, let's go. Three, two, one. Okay, one more. Three, two, one. Okay. Okay, and then we, last but not least, we also have Soundarya as our speaker yesterday who gave an amazing session. We received a lot of positive response and it's, we are very happy to have you back here with us. So here is your certificate of appreciation from us. Thank you very much for your time and you have been an inspiration for all of us. And we look forward to seeing you again to future events as well. Thank you right. so much for having me. May I just say this is the first virtual certification ceremony that I'm a part of and I couldn't afford to miss it absolutely. I love this masterclass and thank you so much for having me again. Thank you so much. And, all right then. Okay, Marjorie. <laughs> oh, I have the spotlight. Okay, so come down, smile, be happy. Three, two, one. Okay, for another one, let's go. Three, two, one. So, okay, thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. You all have been amazing. So thank you very, very much. And we look forward to meeting you all again very soon in future opportunities. Okay, to all of our participants, this is not the end of our master class yet. Okay, so next, we'll have another breakout session and it will be open soon. You can join them and begin the final case study and your a further guidance will then be provided by your facilitators. All the best. Please enter the breakout rooms as it has been open. For those who have not been assigned yet, uh, please kindly rename your username according to the format and we will assign you immediately.
Hello, Aditi. May I know which group you're in? Yes, I'm in group three. I'm really sorry. I just remembered. No worries. Thank you and all the best. Marjorie, wow, <laughs> this is so weird. I'm down there. Yeah. <laughs> only host can do this, is it? Yeah, only the host. Mm -hmm. right. Now we're in a talk show together. Turn <laughs> oh. Music, please. And okay. you need to enter your breakout room. Yes, you have this time. Also, oh. the bed. Oh, my, my back aching. Hold on. I need to stretch a bit. Thank you. Each presentation, you will receive feedback from our dearest director of global health, Kush herself. Oh. So, oh. Kush, the floor is yours. Shall we call the first group? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Team one, you may now present. Okay. Uh, I have a doubt. Like, are we only supposed to present the conclusion slide? Like, that's it, right? Yeah. Okay. So. You can sum it all in the conclusion slide. Take you two minutes to explain your conclusion slide. Yeah, all the best. Oh, thank you. So our problem statement is uh, that hypertension, fitness freak, hypertension is a risk for NCDs or non-communicable diseases. As we uh, uh, discussed, like hypertension is like rise, like it, there's an increase in uh, hypertension among people because of the change in lifestyle with uh, more, uh, I don't know, decrease in exercise and uh, more sedentary life, uh, hypertension has been increasing. And uh, so we uh, want to uh, target the part where uh, the physical activity of the person can increase. So our goal is uh, to walk 20 to 30 minutes for three days a week, like a brisk walk. And uh, this will yeah, so uh, one second. we can ask them to uh, brisk walk and also like some changes in the diet can be done. Like uh, we can uh, increase the sodium, I mean, decrease the sodium and increase the potassium intake. We can uh, reduce. I mean, we obviously people won't stop eating fast food, but we can always reduce the amount of times we order from outside. And uh, yeah, we uh, our intervention would be based on risk walking. Like we can hold uh, friendly competitions, and like you know, just to see like who walks more every day, and uh, this can be fun in a way. And also we can uh, make like small clubs where people can share their experience and how, you know, like they, uh, how they try to stay healthy, like despite having like lack of time and having to go to work early in the morning, coming in the evening and uh, yeah, like, and yeah, also like we, like, since it's a pandemic and uh, everyone's at home. So we can also uh, use the social media. We can create a hashtag like, and, you know, like share videos of uh, people walking and, and, and encouraging others basically. And I guess that will be a effective way of sharing it. Yes, I'm done. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Harshita. Um, 
a great job, Group One. Uh, I heard from your mod, uh, from your facilitator, Jamie, as well. You guys have been working very diligently um, on your group project and your SGD. A little bit of a few pointers. Your program goal, I, I must say, um, it has not been defined. It's rather an intervention. It's uh, it's not the goal. For instance, you mentioned you wanted people to reduce this uh, salt intake and you know practice exercising, practice a healthy lifestyle. So in this case, your program goal could have been uh, to encourage the target population uh, to practice healthier lifestyle re and reduce sodium intake. You know that's what I could see from your intervention and implementation. Whereas for your implementation ideas, they're wonderful. Um, as for problem statement. Um, as I mentioned, your problem statement is why is it a problem, right? So hypertension is a risk factor for NCDs. That sounds like a problem. Whereas a fitness freak, a little is something that shouldn't have been put there because it's uh, a little bit irrelevant in that sense. Uh, your problem statement could have been hypertension has been increasing the, uh, the burden for it. And as it is one of the major risk factors for NCDs. Rest, I think you guys did a great job, but yeah, these are a few pointers uh, for your future presentations whenever you present. Thank you, Group One. Thank you, Group One. And thank you also, Kush, for your feedback. Now we'll proceed to Group Two. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes you are. are. Um, can I start? Go ahead. Okay, thanks. So for our group, the problem statement is hypertension, which affects the majority of the population in country X, is one of the major risk factors for other non-communicable diseases. And the major points we have identified as considering it as a major disease is due to the public's lack of awareness, the lack of screening facilities, an imbalanced diet, majorly a high salt diet, and as well as soap, tobacco and substance abuse. So our program goal is to increase and promote the awareness of NCD among adolescents. We are right now focusing on the adolescent population so as to advocate for a healthier lifestyle. And the interventions we have chosen fall under three major categories of the behavioral, the environmental, and the policy. So under the behavioral or the educational interventions, we have decided to utilize social media in a good sense, like holding challenges and promoting a healthier lifestyle, asking people to push themselves forward, to compete with others in a healthy environment, and also increase the public awareness with the, on the theme of physical activities and also the necessity of a healthy diet. And we have also decided to partner with the Ministry of Health, NGOs, and other stakeholders so as to provide private psychiatric sessions or counselings where participants are guaranteed the privacy and a one-to-one -one conversation so as to resolve their addiction problems or other issues they might be facing. And environmental issues, we have decided to reduce uh, focus on the reduction of the accessibility of tobacco products, reduction of stress levels, which can lead to mental health issues, which can further precipitate the usage of, subs uh, usage of drugs and other substances, and also foster a healthy home environment. As many cases of domestic abuse and violence at home leads to uh, greater alcohol dependence and drug abuse. We have also decided to introduce legislative changes like creating smoking bans and applying increasing the legal age for consumption and uh, of alcohol and all that other substance abuse uh, substance abuse drugs for the implementation we have decided to develop a national educational program for adolescents which focuses on health education at schools to utilize social media and also public webinars, seminars, and all such programs where we can interact and address the issues and also counseling sessions for parents as well, so as they can address their addiction problems and cope with it. And also we are deciding to advocate to the Ministry of Health for the smoking bans to increase the legal age and also work in hand with the police authorities to monitor the sales and use of drug, tobacco, alcohol amongst the minors. And also the last point would be to print the graphic images of the deleterious effects and also helplines in case they need any help in that sense. And um, that is all for now. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Shreya and group two. I must say I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed 
with how vast and how thorough you have been with your presentation or very detailed interventions and implementation plan, um, as well as very well-defined problem statement and your goals. My only comment uh, would be, uh, when you're defining your project, uh, please make sure not to go too broad because um, under this project, uh, the intervention and implementations that you have designed, they're really good, but are they achievable? Um, considering there's so many of them, you, your one project might not be able to advocate or work for all of them. And it might lead to, you know, um, depletion of resources or exhaustion of your resources, available resources. So while you're planning your project, um, because for instance, you know, talking about tobacco and alcohol, um, two of them uh, just, just handling even, even tobacco or alcohol needs a, a single program itself. So just make sure uh, whenever you're planning a project, it does not go too broad, otherwise it might lead uh, to uh, disappointments, you know, when you, you might not be able to complete all of the interventions or implementations, right, since there are too many of them. But yeah, great job overall. I'm really, really impressed. So thank, thank you, Group you. 2. Thank you, Group 2 and Kush. That's a wonderful presentation. And now we'll proceed to the next group, Group 3. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, I'll, I'll start my sharing. Is it visible, guys? Yes, it's visible. All the best Thank to the team. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Aditya Arora, and I'll be representing um, the group three. Now, hypertension is the major public health issue out there. And what we found is that unhealthy diet contributes to it at the major level as well. So our problem statement is adult population in, residing in country X have an unhealthy diet due to limited access to nutrition, support and education, and also lack of awareness, which leads to higher risk of hypertension. Now, this leads us to the main goal of a program which is to create awareness and promote healthy diet, reduction of sodium and cholesterol, inclusions of fruits and vegetables in order to reduce the risk of hypertension. And how do we do that? We will do that in collaboration with GEOs and NGOs. Now the chosen intervention. We wish to intervene through an educational and environmental strategy. I'll just brief through these real quick and explain everything in the implementation part. So the first point will be gathering like-minded people organizing local awareness camps, having strong social media presence, local screening camps can be conducted, collaboration with NGOs and GEOs with a common goal so as to take in it at a national level and make it make a bigger impact and a bigger change. Later, our final plan is to take our plans to the government of country X and thus help the government de deriving policies for the betterment of the country. Now, moving forward, in order to implement our intervention, we have discussed the brief plan of intervention. We begin by coming together of like-minded people with a common goal in a healthier lifestyle, so as to decrease the risk of hypertension in City X. Now we can begin by local awareness camps in schools, busy streets, in community halls, in collaboration with local municipality. Further, after this small change, I'm sure we'll collaborate with more NGOs and more organizations to take our mission at a higher level, at a larger level. Here, we can make a change by having national campaigns, online via campaign apps, social media, urge people via Twitter hashtags, such as hashtag healthy country X, hashtag 21 days challenge for healthy lifestyle, resharing re informative resources, giving rise to a challenge, moving with the trend by reels, bingos, stuff to attract the attention of the general public. I believe a strong social media presence is very, very helpful and is necessary in today's world. Also, what we can do is do screening camps for hypertension in collaboration with local medical centers in busy places like malls, religious places, etc., and organize, organize, um, I'm really sorry, organize the uh, pop-up clinics to help people in screening and also educating them on lifestyle modifications. I believe pop-up clinics can also be very interact, um, very attractive to people and people might go for it. Now, educational seminars and activities can also be conducted to educate people regarding reduction of sodium and cholesterol, inclusion of fruits and vegetables, 
no, social campaigns in collaboration with national and international NGOs, such as Eat Smart, Live Strong from US, Foods to Encourage, Wholesome Rx. Reach out to government organizations and with these government organizations, read out to food processing companies. A few government policies can be made with the help of the government organizations, such as government policies to decrease fruits and veg vegetable prices and ease their accessibility. Government policies to have more and elaborative screening camps. Government policies for the food processing companies for a limited oil and salt incorporation in their products. Government policies to reach more and more population out there. Urge doctors to prescribe fruits and vegetables to low income individuals so that they can have it at a low cost, a policy towards this. Policies to include nutritionist food in office pantries and also with the help of the government increasing tax on processed the junk food. Uh, this is the implementation that we've planned for. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aditi. Uh, as you can see also from the audience uh, faces, you present that your team did a great job. Uh, I have also been well versed with uh, the updates throughout. And uh, I very well know your team was, was ahead of others, uh, very active and the most active team among the all teams. So great job. As well as for your um, project, I, I would like to point it out to the other teams as well. Your problem statement was very specific, as well as your goals, your intervention, and your implementation plan, wherein you also uh, created a flow chart in the conclusion slide uh, as to what do you want to do first and how do you want to proceed further. That's, that's a great job. So I would say full marks on that. Great job, Group 3, and well presented, Aditi. Thank you so much. Wow, well done, Group 3. That was cool. Great job. <laughs> and now I'll proceed to the next team, group four. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm from group four. So as for our problem statement, we know that 45% of the adult population in country X is having hypertension. And there are some causes that leads to this. First of all, it's because the lack of screening programs and education on topic as well as limited access for nutrition support. So for that, our program goal is to first uh, raise the awareness of the public for hypertension and also the modifiable risk factors, including healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, physical activity, mental health, and also to not smoke among adults in country X, and to involve policymakers to promote research for cheaper alternatives to current antihypertensives and to involve public figures in promoting the program. Similar to Group 3, it also will also engage community like um, GO and also NGOs. The intervention chosen is the first right and open method to stakeholders and meet the public figures or community leader to get the permission to start the program and then we would make a primary meeting with the community. And as for the implementation, we would make an educational program on how to measure blood pressure at home, about hidden stock and food, and also physical activities using infographics. To do this, we would also do a screening camp and also collaboration with GO and NGOs, and also local grassroots worker as our intervention and will also collaborate with people so that people would not have language barrier. And last, to help primary healthcare, to buy screening requirements, we would make a charity program such as open donation. I think that is all from Group 4. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you so much, Group 4. Um, as I was also a part of the group force progression today, unfortunately, one of our facilitators, Shah, she got sick, so I was covering in for her. And so I, I did experience a uh, group force progression uh, from where they were confused about the problem statement to them doing a great job working on the program goal, intervention, as well as defining their implementation plan. So great job, group four. I just would like to add, um, that, for instance, in the intervention, you have mentioned about 
just about advocacy by writing open letter to the stakeholders and meeting the public figures. Since your implementation also includes an you know, educational program, you could have mentioned about um, using the, the strategy number one as well, that, you know, this, the educational or behavior change therapy. There's a little bit of a mismatch there, but I think uh, for the rest, um, you've done a decent job. Thank you, Group 4. Thank you, Kosh. Thank you, Group 4. Good job. Now we'll proceed to the next group, Group 5. Hello everyone, this is uh, representing group five. Uh, so our problem statement, we have actually clubbed everything together and put an umbrella term for this, like hypertension, poor awareness and poor intervention. Uh, why we put this, uh, like, because it all started with poor awareness because people were having inactive lifestyle because they were not much aware. And this became their most country with the most number of hypertensive cases because there was poor intervention, their public health was not sophisticated, it was not giving timely intervention. And that's why we clubbed it together, poor awareness and intervention, because it becomes like this term becomes uh, easier to combat the goal, to combat the issues. Uh, if, even if there was a, a awareness and there was not intervention, it wouldn't have been done together. So uh, there was poor intervention, poor awareness among the people that let it become the highest number, highest country within the highest number of cases. So uh, we created a program goal in such a way we wanted to create awareness because I think it all starts with creating awareness and creating intervention as well. Even, um, even uh, after like uh, creating intervention, we need to make people aware about how what can be done, how it can be done, what are the ways. So for this, we need to have an awareness program. Uh, that's why we choose uh, intervention that is a national hypertensive month because we are trying to uh, club all these things together. In the hypertensive month, we want to make it uh, like, uh, not only by in terms of awareness, not only in terms of intervention, but we want to make it more easy and reachable to the people to let them know about the risk factors, to have an uh, introduction, just the introduction of the digital health system, not to make it more like uh, the funding crowd, uh, because we won't just introduce about the infographics. We want to free that. Uh, we want to ma uh, make surveys easily accessible to the people. And we usually uh, targeted two sets of people, like people who are diseased and people who are at the risk. Uh, diseased people we targeted just uh, for the sake, because we don't want to have comorbidity patient maybe that diabetes or kidney uh, disease and the people who are at risk we intervened just because of the fact because these are the population that can be saved and especially the young especially the young people so in the hypertension month we are having campaigns mass campaigns webinars surveys and uh, reaching out to the population that are not living in a good condition, just relieving the stress because stress has become a very much important factor in today's world. May it be combating with the pandemics and combating with so many ongoing things. So uh, we want to make it like more socializing and in the implementation, obviously we want, uh, want to make it easy and attractive. So we will start with some educational e videos and yes, easily and timely because it would be time consuming to introduce people to the digital health and infographics. So we put it in, in, inside the uh, easy and timely uh, sec uh, because it would be a, like a funding issue would be with the digital system and people are not that much aware about the digital system. And the attractive part would be if people will be given their free screening program, they would opt out for it because whatever comes free, like becomes interesting and we usually subsidize the treatments and socially to in, uh, enhance to reach out the people and to make uh, information in a learning chain we want to have a webinar we want to have supporting groups and we want to have experienced speakers so we uh, i think it all starts with knowing a problem and then uh, combating the same problem at the same time and uh, i think thank you so much for all of my group it was my uh, representation for group and I just want next slide to be played so that I can show my cool group. Uh, we have been working from yesterday uh, till today, and it was really interesting for all having this group. And we put forward all these ideas. And thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Group Five and Asma. Cute picture, yeah. And also, uh, coming back to your presentation, I must say, very specific. You, um, it was all directly linked in terms of you, your objective and your problem statement was lack of awareness. That was your goal. That was your intervention. That was your implementation. I liked how you used the EAST framework for behavioral change uh, to raise that awareness. Uh, that's really, really appreciable. It's just that um, you try to do everything within that, right? Uh, it sounded a little bit ambitious, 
uh, in terms of um, you know getting those subsidized treatments, um, getting uh, those free system, getting the system digitalized. Um, it is possible, uh, but as I just mentioned, I think to one of the groups earlier as well, you need to be a little bit realistic and relevant as well um, as to what all activities can be possible considering the resources, right? Um, for instance, subsidizing the treatments might not be possible for a student uh, organization or a student team what, whatsoever. You need to think about collaborating or, you know, um, lobbying to stakeholders to subsidize those treatments. Um, rather than you, your team getting it done, or, you know, the project team getting it done yourself. Rest, I think it was it was a great job. Thank you, Group Five. And thank you, Asma. Thank you so much. So for the resources part, like you said, uh, we were having a kind of uh, like sponsors for that part, so that if it's possible, like it, it's uh, we are like collaborating in a, just one month. We are having sponsors for so many of events, so that we can combat that problem as well. Thank you so much for your uh, references. Thank you so much. Thank you, Asma. Thank you, group. Bye. Back to Will. Thank you. That's a wonderful presentation. Great job. And thank you also to Kush. So now that means since we have arrived to our last group, that also means that it's the end of day two and the end of the Global Health Masterclass session. A very, very big thank you for everyone here who have participated from the very beginning till the end for all of you all Woo! okay so this has been philia <laughs> the boce retiring soon your host for today bye bye <laughs> okay so see you in our next and final master class session of this tenure from the e-newsletter team okay so before we completely end and close this zoom let's take a picture together right okay everyone please turn on your camera Let's take a picture together. Okay. All right, we are waiting. More people. We'll wait for another few seconds and then we'll take it. Okay, all right, let's take it now. Smile in three, two, one.